The story begins with a battle between humans and monsters. It deals easily with this animal. The monster falls to the ground. This meat will last for a week. This girl is a D-class hunter in the Adventurer's Guild. Her buddy congratulates her for killing the D-class monsters so easily. She is just a hunter even though she was demoted a few years ago. From class C to class D because of an incident. The girl slips in the mud. She falls down after dropping the loot bags. At least Sena thought she was a hunter. Suddenly, through her dream, she hears her manager, the deputy director, calling her. Sena is sitting in her office when she is told that it is lunchtime and she might be late for a meeting. She must have fallen asleep while reading a book called The Secret of the Flower Shop. She began to find the story uninteresting after the main character escaped. She will probably finish it after the meeting. The girl remembers this moment when she was in the hospital after fighting the monsters. She was reborn into the main character of the novel and remembered it in the hospital. But she can't remember anything but the first few chapters. The doctors tell the girl that she hit her head hard, but somehow she is fine and very lucky. One of the doctors says that this number of injuries is probably normal for a hunter. Now the girl remembers that she used to live like a hunter. The lives of the hunters in such a novel are usually governed by the way of God. And perhaps it is. Suddenly, the girl says the word status window. Hearing this, the doctor tells the nurse to admit this patient and prepare for surgery. She says that if they delay for even one second, she might lose her mind completely. Sani assures them that she is fine. As she leaves the hospital, she thinks that if she is not dead, she will have to spend all the money she has earned to pay the bill for her treatment. And now she does not know what she will have to live on for the next month. But besides the lack of money, she still can't believe that this is nothing more than a fictional universe. Why did she work so hard in her past life? And what is her role in this life? The chance of a character who cannot use the status window becoming the main character is zero, and she will be happy to become at least a secondary character. But first, she has to remember if there was a hunter character in history who looked like her. She remembers the title, but is not sure about the plot. She also remembers that the main character's name was Ellen. Suddenly she sees a man with the same name talking to her neighbor and telling her that he loves her. Sana remembers that in the novel, the owner of a flower shop named Ellen receives declarations of love every day. This girl is the main character of the story The Mystery of the Flower Shop. It turns out that she has been living next door to the protagonist all along. Sana tries to remember if there was ever a character who lived next door to the protagonist, and was extremely successful. She remembers that there was an extremely rich neighbor. If she really was reborn in the novel, where is her status window? Does this mean that she is just a neighbor? A minor addition to the main characters. It has been a month since Sainer realized she was reborn. Of course, she was shocked that she was just an addition, but after a few weeks, she accepted the fact. It might not be so bad to play a minor role in such a character. During this time, she remembered something about the original short story. It was a story about a Sifts, based on the main male character. Every day Ellen received declarations of love, and every day she rejected them, but could not return them. However, as you may have noticed, there were only a handful of minor characters whose leading roles were to be rejected. And while Sena was watching Ellen, she discovered a strange rule of this universe. Ellen only confesses her feelings to one man a day. In this case, the search for the protagonist can take forever. Anyway, today's confession scene is over. But suddenly another man comes in. His name is Dion and Ellen is very happy to see him. He also tells her that he loves her and asks her to marry him. This is very unexpected because there has already been a confession today. This boring one confession rule had been in place for a month. And finally it was destroyed by a person who definitely did not look like a minor character. Dion promises to make Helene the happiest girl in the world. But the girl repeats the words she has said to all such boys, she is sorry. The boy asks if it is because he is not worthy of her. Ellen replies that it is because they have only known each other for a month. Dion says that even if this is true, his feelings for her go far beyond time. To Sena, these words sound like a cliché. She had hoped that this rule would not work and that things would be different with him. But Helene rejected that too. Then the others will play the same role as usual. She already knows all the following events. First, Ellen turns around and goes to the shop. Then the man falls to his knees. Sana's hopes never come true. What did she expect? And yet, breaking the rule is like a breath of fresh air. It deserves a higher score. Looking at Dion, the girl thinks he is in the same condition as everyone else. Every man who confessed his feelings to Ellen later sat outside her house and mourned his lost hopes. This man was no exception. Unfortunately, the same goes for this, the second confession so far. It doesn't even surprise Sana anymore. She can't believe he's still crying. 
and what's even stranger is that he's doing it right in front of her door. Meanwhile, the others gather themselves and go back where they came from. But the person who violated the principle of one day, one person is completely different from the others. I could see it in his face. The boy was still standing at Sana's door. His heart seemed to be broken. The girl decides to give him some more time. A day passes. The evening passes. The night comes. It begins to rain. But the boy still sits where he was before. Sana decides to go to Dion. She asks him how long he will cry there. The boy apologizes. The girl sees that the boy is very handsome. He has silver hair and blue eyes. Sana remembers this appearance. She asks the boy if he is Dion Fravel. The boy asks how she knows him. Sana asks what a nobleman like him is doing here. Her colleagues told her that he is the eldest son of the head of their guild. They said he had silver hair and blue eyes and was very handsome. Sana could not believe that such a person existed in her guild. Because if he did, she would have known about him. Then her colleagues told her that people didn't know about him because the chief had forbidden him to visit the guild. This is because he is a rude hooligan who behaves badly all the time. There, in the rain, the girl has an idea. If she can get the guild leader's son to recognize her, she will be restored to her C-class rank. She decides that she must be as nice and friendly as possible to get the boy to like her. She tells him that the place he is standing is actually her home. Dion apologizes and says that he didn't mean to be a nuisance. The girl says that everything is fine and suggests that they wait inside for the rain. And the guy agrees to come over. At home, Sena offers Dion a blanket and hot tea. She noticed that the boy was not at all like the gossip described him. He doesn't act like a terrible person. She also doesn't remember a guy with silver hair in the novel. So he is also a secondary character. Apparently, the chairman's son is powerless against the plot of the novel. Maybe the fact that he violated the principle is the author's mistake. Dion is very grateful that the girl cares for him and asks if it is true that she saw everything. Sana asks what he means. He knows that she was there when he confessed to Helene. The girl asks him not to worry about rejection because it is part of life. Dion asks if she can listen to his story until the rain stops. Sana says he can start. The boy says that he and Helene have known each other since childhood. She was his first love. The girl remembers Ellen saying that they only knew each other for a month. Dion says that this is because she erased all her memories. The main character in this world is Ellen Euclid. She was the illegitimate child of the Marquis of Euclid and therefore grew up under eternal oppression. And in the end the girl ran away from home. But she could not forget her painful past. One day she found a witch who erased all her memories. Sana remembers the story. Apparently, she has such a good photographic memory that she can recite the text of a story she read in her past life. Dion tells us that once, when he was younger, he attended a ball where he was all alone. Ellen was the only one who spoke to him that day. The touch of her warm hand allowed him to move forward. He could not imagine how much suffering this kind girl had endured. And when he learned that she had erased her memories and run away, he searched every corner of the capital for her. And when he finally found her, the fact that she did not remember him did not matter at all. He knew he could protect her no matter what. He convinced himself that they would be able to start from scratch. But time passed, and more and more men began to confess their love for her. And his patience was not infinite. Besides, a suspicious man had been following her for two weeks. He seemed to be a regular visitor, but he also had a high status. Sana asks him if he thinks Ellen's family might have sent this man. He is worried because the people from Euclid's family are also looking for her. But right now he's a nobody to Ellen, so he can't just come forward and offer to help. Now Sana understands why he wanted to marry her and become a close friend. The rain stopped while they talked. Dion says he must have taken up too much of her time, so he has to leave. She hoped he wasn't too upset, and she is sure there is still hope. Dion says goodbye and thanks her for listening to his story. As he closes the door behind him, she thinks that she is very tired and hopes that she has not hurt his feelings. She decides that she would like to sleep now, but first she should take a shower. Suddenly Sana realizes that Dion called her by her first name, but she doesn't remember introducing herself to him. The noise outside the window woke Sana up much earlier than usual, considering that she had fallen asleep very late last night. She wants to know what kind of fool is making noise outside the window, so she opens the front door, accidentally hitting the person standing behind it. The man greets her and says he didn't realize he was standing right in front of her door, so he apologizes for disturbing her. Sana thinks it's just a child. She says she came outside to see why it was so loud today. She asks what is going on, why are there knights in full armor, and if they are going to arrest anyone. The boy says that they are here because of the lady who owns this flower shop. Her master wants to hire her as his personal gardener. 
He made it clear to them that it had to be her, so they came all this way to get her. Sena wonders why a nobleman with so many servants would be interested in a small town flower shop owner. She assumes that the suspicious man Dion mentioned yesterday is involved. The girl thinks it shouldn't make any difference to her. She bids him farewell, wishes him good luck in winning the girl's heart, and asks him to be quiet as they leave. She is about to close the door when a man stops her and enters her house, asking if she lives there. Sena says that he is in the wrong place and that the flower shop is on the other side of the wall. The man replies that he has already finished his business at that place. The girl is perplexed and asks why he would break into her house. The boy she first met asks the knight if he has already made a deal with the owner of the flower shop, but he says no, and the girl has not accepted his offer, so he asks Sena to name the price. Does he really want to buy her house? The man mentions that he has not yet introduced himself and says that his name is Rashad Carlman. Sena says that if he is the Rashad Carlman she knows, he must be a duke. The man says he is and asks her how much she wants for the house. The girl says that he is a very important, famous and noble man, even in the capital, so she asks why he needs her hut if he has many estates. She then guesses that this is part of his plan to get closer to Helen. She can't let him get away with such a dubious act. The duke says he will pay handsomely, but the girl refuses his offer, explaining that her grandfather built this house and that it is full of memories of her family. That is why she will never sell it to them. The duke's assistant asks the girl how she dares to disobey his highness. Sena asks why she should do so when she is not even his ward. The man says that this is insolence and tries to hit the girl, but misses. She strikes him back. She encourages him to hit her if he can, warning that she will not be submissive and may retaliate. The man starts to draw his sword, but the duke stops him. The boy Sany first met offers to calm down and talk things over, but he is hit by the door again. He thinks the door must hate him. Dion enters the room and asks the boy if he is all right. Sena asks Dion what he is doing here. Rashad asks him the same. It turns out that Dion and the Duke know each other. The boy asks his highness what brought him here. The Duke tells him that he has come to buy the house. Dion asks what he is talking about, since he was the one who wanted to buy the house. Sena reminds him that it is not for sale. Rashad asks Dion if he is going to challenge him. They start bidding on each other as if they were at an auction. Sena can't stand it anymore and orders them both to shut up. She asks if they haven't realized that she won't sell the house. The room falls strangely silent after these words. The girl must have shouted too loudly because her head began to hurt. Rashad says they probably won't come to an agreement today. He leaves, promising to come back another time. After the Duke leaves, Dion tries to ask the girl something, but she falls down with a severe headache. The boy calls a doctor for Sena. The doctor tells her that it is a cold and that she will feel better after a little rest. He asks Dion to let her rest at home for a few days and calls her his wife. She leaves. The doctor must have misunderstood when he called Sani his wife because the lady next door had left him yesterday. She thanks him for calling the doctor and helping her. Dion says that there is no need to thank him and that he had actually come to see Helene, but decided to look in on Sana because it was so loud. The girl says he's just in time. Dion says he is very sorry. He made her stand in the rain yesterday. He thinks it was his fault she got sick. These words moved even Sena. How can anyone be angry with him when he apologizes with such a sweet expression on his face? The girl says that everything is fine because it is just a cold and nothing to worry about and that he is the reason why Rashad left. Dion asks her not to think too much because he didn't really want to buy her house. He just thought she needed help. Sena says she knew it and he really surprised her with his idea. In other words, he was able to save her house. Dion is happy to hear this. He says he will continue to watch over the house until she is well, so he asks her to lie down and rest. The girl says she thought the boy had come to see the girl next door. Dion says that in any case he can come to her neighbor's house another time. He covers her with a blanket, but she says she is still very tired and really needs to get some sleep. He says he will stay until she feels better. Sena says she has something she wants to ask him the next time they see each other. Dion tells her to feel free to do so. The girl says that when he left her house he called her by name and she asks if she ever told him her name. Dion says she actually said her name. The day they met for the first time. Sena says she doesn't remember anything. She thinks it doesn't sound like a lie and maybe she forgot what she told him. And anyway, why should he lie about something like that, since he is also trustworthy? She has something to say about the suspicious man Dion mentioned earlier. Sena asks if the man is Duke Rashad. To the girl's surprise, Dion replies that he is not. He tells her that the man also had dark hair, but it was long and more purple in color. Sena wonders who it could be. Suddenly she says that it doesn't matter because she is not in a position to worry about her neighbor right now. 
Duke Rashad says that he will come back and if he tries to buy her house again, then. She asks if she should hit him, but then she would probably be arrested. So should she hit him when no one is looking? Dion smiles and says that of course it could work. In the evening, Sena thanks the boy for his help today and asks him to get home safely. Dion tells him not to worry and bids him good night. Outside, he thinks that what he said wasn't technically a lie. Meanwhile, Helene wonders if the Duke had a safe trip home last night. Rashad then tells the girl that she needs someone with her talents, and she thought he did not want her because of her looks. His Highness was the only man who had ever treated her that way. But Ellen felt that being a gardener on His Highness's estate was too much for her. So, although she was very grateful for the offer, she had to decline. She tells this to a friend. He asks, what if this man is really in love with her? But Ellen says that is not possible. At least she thinks so, although she admits to herself that she does have feelings for him. She thinks that maybe the Duke is just using the job offer as an excuse to get closer to her. Suddenly Sena calls out to her. She says she wants to buy some white flowers. Ellen says she hasn't seen her for a long time and asks if she lives around here. Sena asks if something good has happened to her because she seems very happy today. Ellen says that if the girl asks, she will tell her. She tells him that yesterday a man of high rank came to see her and asked her to be his gardener. She thought he had only come to confess to her like everyone else. But it was the first time anyone had ever been more interested in her skills than in her looks. She thinks that is why she is in such a good mood today. This is not the reaction Sena expected, for it seems that Ellen has developed feelings for this duke. Ellen also says that she turned down the offer, because she is sure that she cannot handle such a high position. Suddenly she says that she talks too much and goes to get the flowers that Sena wanted. This time Ellen refused Rashad, but it is not known when he will return to try to convince her again. And it looks like he almost succeeded. Then it means that Dion can't be with Helene, and that his fears will come true. But it's so sad. Sena just wanted to live a quiet life here, but perhaps she will have to intervene. Ellen asks why the girl wears white flowers. Sena says she is going to visit her grandfather's grave. Sena says something happened yesterday and she's not sure if she can share it. But she says that someone broke into her house yesterday and that it was none other than Duke Rashad. She says that he demanded that she sell her house to him and that Rashad was very aggressive about it as if he were threatening her. Sena takes Helene's hands and tells her that she can take care of herself but she is more concerned about her because apparently his highness is looking for houses in the neighborhood, and apparently he likes to harass those who refuse him. Ellen wonders how he could do such a thing. She wonders if he came to her house because of her house. Then he offered her a room to sleep in if she came to work for him, but she didn't understand why he would do such a thing for a gardener. Now she thinks it was a trick to get her house, and that he was not at all in love with her. Ellen had never imagined that he would turn out to be such a person. Sena says that because she is a hunter, she can defend herself, but Ellen is much more vulnerable. She tells the girl to be careful and never to get involved with the Duke. Or better yet, just ignore him. The girl thanks Sena for telling her all this and promises to be careful with him. Now Sena thinks that Duke Rashad will never be able to get close to Helene again. Sena tells Dion that Ellen now thinks the Duke is a bad man, so he has nothing to worry about. And he definitely has a chance now. The boy asks, in other words, that she has deliberately degraded the duke in Ellen's eyes. Sena says it was completely unintentional. She adds that what she said was based on undeniable facts. Dion asks what she will do if the duke finds out. Suddenly, the girl says that Helene has just left the house. She tells the boy to at least go and say hello. But he didn't have time. Dion is thanking Sena for her help. The girl thinks that he looks somehow depressed, and that it must be because of Helene's abrupt rejection and that perhaps it has greatly affected his pride. She touches his shoulder in a friendly way and tells him that it is too early to give up hope and that he must try everything. She promises to help the boy. He doesn't say anything, but suddenly touches Sena's forehead. He tells her to take care of herself first, since she still has a fever, and he asks her not to do that next time. That is, not to stand in the way of the duke in order to help him, for that would put her in danger. He says that he has decided to let Helen go. When Sena is alone, she wonders why Dion has decided to give up so easily, since he said he loved Helene all his life. She is also worried that he will not run away to cry alone as he did the last time, and she looks for him everywhere, and she is afraid that the bandits will not find him in this state. Suddenly she hears some shouting. She thinks it is Dion who is in danger and runs to save him. When she arrives at the place where the noise came from, she sees men lying on the ground, beaten. Dion is standing over them. She does not appear from behind the corner of the building. 
Theon senses someone hiding there and suddenly tells them to come out. The girl wonders if he is talking to her. He asks if he really thinks this wall will completely hide his boar carcass. Sena thinks that it is certainly big, but not that big. A man comes out of the darkness and Dion addresses him as Turner and asks why he was hiding. He says the boy looked too terrible. Sena thinks that she really wouldn't make a good boar and wonders who Turner is. Suddenly the crowd of beaten men get up and run away from them. Dion asks what is the point of running away so fast, since they are going to die anyway. Turner says that the people upstairs have contacted him and are asking if Dion is really investigating. But before he can finish, the man asks if he is going to tell him that he is not doing anything here. Turner says that is certainly not true. Dion pats him on the head and says that's good because even if he was from the other side he wouldn't do that to him and asks if he is. Suddenly a girl approaches Dion and tells him to hurry because they have to leave. And the three of them left. Sena cannot believe that Dion is the murderer. Suddenly, the girl asks Dion if something is wrong because she thinks he is not himself. After all, they've found Helene and now they have nothing to worry about. The boy says that's not the problem. The girl asks if it is because of Sena Rohill. The girl listens to the whole conversation. The next day Sena thinks that the Dion she saw yesterday is the one she saw yesterday. Was completely different from the one she was used to. What did Turner mean when he talked about the people upstairs? At work she mentions that he's the son of an important person, so maybe he's a secret agent for the association or something like that. It is Sena's turn to talk to Anna. She is glad to see the girl again. Anna asks if she has come on an errand as usual. Sena says she actually came to ask if Anna knows who Dion Fravel is, and if she knows anything else except that he is the chairman's son. Anna says that maybe all she knows is that he's a hot but crazy bastard. He is from her first marriage, but apparently the chairman's brothers and sisters gave his wife a lot of trouble, because she was not of high status. After that she died quite young. Everyone gossiped that her death was due to the mistreatment of the chairman's family, and Dion must have believed the same thing, and from then on he began to take revenge on them. Anna asks Sena if she knew that the chairman's younger brother, Selen, had broken off his engagement, adding that it was because Dion had taken his bride away from him. Anna then asks the girl if she knows the chairman's younger sister, Isabella, who says that her engagement was also broken off by Dion. Sena asks if he seduced his aunt. Anna says no way, he seduced her fiancé. The girl asks if she now understands why people think he is a hot but crazy bastard. Sena wonders if they are talking about the same Dion. In other words, Anna tells the girl never to contact him. She doesn't think that the girl is asking about all this out of boredom and assumes that she has already met him somewhere. Sena says that this is not the case. Anna says that she should stay away from him no matter what, because Dion is a really dangerous person. Sena tells her not to worry and asks her to make sure she has some good errands for her when they come in. Suddenly Anna asks Sena to pay attention to a very handsome boy, and it is Duke Rashad. The girl thinks she had better get out of here before he sees her. She quickly says goodbye to Anna and leaves. Suddenly she meets her colleagues. One of them, named Marcel, says that he thought the girl was dead, but she is still here, unharmed. Everyone looks at Sena and she says that she is perfectly well and thanks the boy for his concern. Marcel asks her if she still wants to be so formal with him, since they are both hunters now, and he tells her to relax. Sena is afraid that the Duke will see her, but she says that they will probably be done with the greetings and that she should go. One of the boys says that he is really impressed that the chairman did not expel her. He asks who knows who she will get into trouble with next and if she is not ashamed to be in the association. He adds that like father, like daughter and says that the girl looks just like him. Marcel asks if this means that Sena will have the same miserable death as her father. The girl clenches her fist and says that he should be careful what he says. She says her father is still alive. Marcel asks if she is still clinging to this foolish hope. Sena says that they weren't even friends and asks why the hell he talks to her every time they see each other. She also asks him for advice. She tells him to brush his fucking teeth and calls him a dirty piece of shit. She adds that it is no wonder that girls always reject him because his breath stinks. Marcel is very angry and asks her how she dared to say such a thing. Sena asks him if he wants her to list the names of all the girls who have rejected him, adding that it will probably take her all night. The man grabs her by the collar and tells her to shut up. Sena calmly tells him to stop bothering her. He knows he can't beat her in a fight. Marcel shakes his fist at the girl. Sena thinks it would be good if he hit her first, so that all her blows would be considered self-defense. Suddenly someone stops the boy. It is Rashad, and he asks Marcel if he doesn't think it is rather dishonorable and cowardly to attack them like this. The boy tries to take his hand away, asks the duke who he is and demands that he let him go. Rashad tells him to stop playing the fool, for he can hardly hold him. 
The Duke throws Marcel to the ground. The boy asks if the man thinks he can get away with it. Rashad says that Marcel is just a shrimp. She asks Sana if she is hurt. She wonders why he intervenes at all, since it is no longer self-defense if he threw the first punch. Although Sana's perfect plan for self-defense failed miserably, she tells the Duke that everything is fine and thanks him for his help. Suddenly, Rashad recognizes the girl as the owner of the house he wanted to buy and asks if she is. The girl says that it is. Suddenly Marcel, who is behind the Duke, stands up. Sana warns the Duke. He turns around. She fends off the boy's attack. Rashad says that he is not only weak but also slow. Suddenly Marcel, who is extremely angry, pulls out a knife. The girl tells the boy that he is a coward. She can't allow such arbitrariness. She kicks the knife out of his hand. And the Duke strikes him with a crushing blow. He asks Sana if she is well. She is pleased and says that the bastard finally got what he deserved. Suddenly, three men in uniforms appear, ordering everyone to stand still and asking what kind of beating is going on in the guild hall. They arrest those involved. Sana eats bread behind bars, thinking it's just bad luck. She wonders why the guard ran when they hit back. If they had hit them once, they might have tried to negotiate. She also wonders why Rashad was walking around unguarded, since he is a duke. The girl asks his highness if he is well. The man says that he is fine and that he will be taken away soon anyway. His aide will come for him. Rashad apologizes to Sana for this time. He clarifies that he is talking about the time he broke into her house without her consent. He made sure that Gerd was also punished for his actions. Sana asks who Gerd is. Does he mean the knight who broke into her house with him? Rashad says that he is a lazy fool who never wanted to be properly trained. The duke keeps him around as long as he does because his father was a long-time subject of his family. Sana tells him not to worry because he didn't hit her and nothing happened. She thinks that any other nobleman in his situation would have acted differently. They would have shouted her famous name and threatened to kill her. But for some reason the duke behaves very differently, which she finds very strange. Look at Marcel. His family is now noble only because of his title. But he still behaves like a fool with privileges. Three hours have passed. They were still in the same cell. The duke's advisor has not yet appeared. Sani asks the duke if something could have happened to his advisor. Rashad asks what for example. The girl says she is not sure and just wonders what could have happened to him. She asks to be allowed to think about it and asks if it is true that they are now in the same boat. Sana decides to tell the guards that her companion is actually a duke and asks if they don't think it would be in everyone's best interest to let her out already. The guard asks what she is talking about, for why would such a noble gentleman allow himself to be brought here? If he were really a duke, someone would have come for him long ago. Suddenly an elderly man appeared, greeted her, and said that he had come for Sana. This man was the butler of young Mr. Marcel, and he was here on his behalf to demand the payment of a million rupees. Sana says that this is ridiculous. The butler says that this is in view of the damage she has done to him today and all the other damage she has done to him so far. He says that it was her father who killed his young master Marcel's mentor. Sana says sharply that this is a complete lie and that it was nothing more than an accident in the line of duty. The butler says that she must accept the facts. Elia, Marcel's mentor, accepted the request because of her father and that is why she was killed. The girl defends her father and angrily says that Elia had only accepted the errand as a hunter and that her father had done nothing wrong. The butler says that in any case, she must make sure that she has paid for the damage by the end of tomorrow but he adds that there is a condition. If her ally is willing to be bound and beaten by his young master, then she need pay nothing. And if he kneels down now, he will probably escape a few blows. Suddenly the advisor for whom Rashad and Sena had been waiting appeared. The boy addresses the duke as his highness, and those present, who did not know the man's background before, realize who he is. Sena tells the duke's assistant that the man has just said that he wants to tie up his highness and give him to his young master to beat. She asks if he can imagine such a thing. Suddenly, the butler begins to apologize, saying that they misunderstood. But this fellow is really angry now. The butler says they don't need to worry. The boy asks what all the talk about beating his highness was about. The butler says he must have been going crazy all these days. He points at Sana and says that she is the one who must pay the debt. The girl begins to argue that she shouldn't have to pay the money, but is suddenly interrupted by the duke, who says that he will pay it all for her. The butler apologizes to his highness and clarifies that it is the girl's debt. Rashad asks if there is any problem. The butler, sweating with excitement, says that there is no problem at all and that they would be honored to accept his money. But Sana does not agree that the duke should pay for her. She thinks that he is the last person she should be indebted to. He can force her to sell her house if she does not pay him back. Sana tells Rashad that she will never borrow money from him. 
In fact, there is no reason to pay such a ridiculous amount. She tells the butler to show her the way to Marseille right away, and she wants to see the bastard's condition for herself. The butler calls Sena an impertinent girl and says that his young master is not able to see anyone at the moment. The girl says that if he does not go with her, she will go alone. She leaves and says that it is very easy to find out where Marcel lives anyway. The man tells her to stop here. The butler takes her arm and says that he has already told her that his young master is not in a good condition. Suddenly, Rashad interrupts them again, asking Sena if they shouldn't be in the same boat as cellmates, as she said they were. In the evening they are released, but the butler has only agreed to 600,000 rupees. But the worst thing for Sena is that the duke actually paid her. Now she is worried about her house. Outside her house, she tells Rashad that she will never sell her house to him. The duke says that she has no intention of doing so. The girl asks why he paid for her. The man replies that you could say he did it to make amends for the last time. The duke says goodbye so easily and takes her home. Sena doesn't understand what happened, that he took her home. When Sena wakes up in her room in the morning, she thinks the street is loud again. From the window she sees that many people have gathered outside Ellen's house today. Even the police are there. She runs to the girl's house as fast as she can. Panicked, Sena asks a lady in the crowd what is going on and if anything has happened at the flower shop. The woman says that a thief broke into the house. Suddenly, she sees someone being carried out of the shop on a stretcher covered with a white tablecloth, which is completely covered in blood. She thinks it is Ellen. Sena wants to see what happened to the girl, but the police won't let her. But the girl pushes the officer away and goes to Helene. She pulls back the cloth, but instead of a girl, she sees a boy. Later, Sena meets the owner of the flower shop, tells her how she confused her, and Ellen asks if the girl really cared that much for her. Sena says that she was told there had been a burglary, and then she saw someone being carried away on a stretcher, so of course she started to worry. She asks who the poor man on the stretcher was. Helene says it was one of the policemen who came to see her when she sent in the report. Only he slipped on the water that the girl had accidentally spilled and fell and they covered his face because he was too ashamed of the fall that caused all the commotion. Sena asked whether they had caught the thief. Ellen answers that the thief escaped through the window before the police arrived. She thinks he left when he realized there was nothing to steal. In any case, Sena is glad that the girl is well. She thinks that the story of the thief might have been part of the plot of the novel. If the duke had bought her house and lived there, he would have saved Helen from danger. The girl thinks that Helen might have been in danger because of her. And since they live in a dangerous neighborhood, Helen could be in real danger if Sena keeps the main characters from interacting with her. Ellen takes Sena's hand, tells her not to worry, and says that she is very happy to be with her now. She reminds her that a little earlier many of the neighbors had come to check on her. She says that it is the greatest blessing to be surrounded by such kind people. Suddenly Sena notices a suspicious person outside the window. She tells Ellen that it is time for her to leave. Outside, Sena tries to catch up with the man who just followed Ellen. She finally catches up with him and throws him to the ground, asking him who he is and what he is doing here. The boy cries out in pain but says it is him, Aaron. This is the first time Sena hears this name. The boy asks if she is serious and says that they only met yesterday. The girl takes off his hood and sees the duke's advisor. Sena and Aaron sit at the table. The girl sees that the duke has finally bought the house next to Ellen's, and given that, he must be obscenely rich. Aaron says that he is neither a spy nor a thief, and he doesn't even have the strength to be either, since he can barely run for ten seconds at a time. Sena says that if this is true, he should be examined in a hospital. The boy says that she should know for sure that they chased the thief away yesterday, and then reported it to the police. The thieves did not expect to be met, so they ran away before the police arrived. Aaron says they are very lucky that they noticed the incident right away, and have been even more vigilant since. But Sena tells him to stop and asks if he has been a spy all along. He didn't mean that they had been watching Ellen all the time. The boy says that his highness is not that kind of person, and swears that she simply misunderstood. He explains that Lady Ellen is simply a very important person to his highness, and that he was simply trying to protect her from others. And that, in any case, he is very glad that Lady Ellen is well, but that he is still a little sorry that, in reality, they do not have the opportunity to have the lady's house entirely under their supervision. Which is very strange, as their houses are only a few yards apart. Sena reminds him that she does not sell her house and never will. She said that when they had cleared up any misunderstandings, she would leave. When the girl gets home, she thinks that there is still something suspicious about the case. Aaron stammered very badly when he spoke, which was strange, and even more so since they were supposed to protect Ellen. She had thought that Rashad had simply fallen in love with Helene, 
but now she thought that there was a deeper reason why he was so willing to stay by her side. She noticed that the lights were still on in the Duke's house. It is indeed strange that he would have his men stay up all night just to keep an eye on Helen. She finds it hard to believe that they do not have ulterior motives. Suddenly she hears the Duke's voice outside, and some noise with it. She picks up her sword and runs, thinking that no matter what happens, she cannot ignore her cellmate who has paid for her stay here. When she steps outside, it is surprisingly quiet. She notices that the door to the neighboring house is not even closed, so she goes inside. Inside, she smells a strong odor of flowers, which is very strange for Autumn. Suddenly a creaking sound is heard. She then looks at the instrument which shows that a demon has appeared in this town. Again she mentions the duke. She finds him sitting on the floor in the corner. He appears to be delirious and mumbling. The girl begins to shake the duke and asks him to come too. Rashad says in a cold sweat that he is sure it was the lady, but it was not him. Saina beats him with all her might and repeats that he should come to his senses. Suddenly the duke comes to himself, rises and asks if she could not have warned him before that the house was haunted. And if he had known that there were ghosts here, he would never have stayed here alone. The duke blames the girl, even though he never told her that he had moved here. With the help of another of her special devices, Saina proposes to find the source of these sounds. The duke is already afraid when he thinks about the ghosts, and she suggests to find them. The girl asks his highness if he is so afraid of ghosts. Rashad says he is not afraid at all. They begin to search the rooms, but the duke is really afraid and Saina keeps joking with him. She realizes that the source of the noises is in the cellar and asks his highness to stay outside. But the duke decides to go with her. Saina mentions that she has a mana stone that can be used as a light source. Rashad asks the girl to go back for a long time. But at one point this makes her very angry. She then tells his highness that what is down there is not a ghost at all, but a demon. She shows him a stone that reacts to demons, and it is now activated. She tells him that the sweet smell in the house is also proof, although she has no idea what this demon is doing here. Suddenly a strong wind in the basement knocks Sena off her feet. Rashad thinks it is very strange to feel such a strong wind in a room without windows. But the girl says it is only a small draft. Mana's stone rolls into the next room and in its light they suddenly saw a girl who looked very much like Ellen. Saina is not at all afraid of this girl, saying that she is only an imposter, but the duke is completely frightened. The girl says that her back hurts after the fall, so she asks the duke to pick up her mana stone, which fell right next to the girl. Rashad is trembling but decides to do it. Saina cannot believe that this is the same person who broke into her house a few days ago. The duke picks up the stone happily and says that he has succeeded. When he notices that Sena is looking up behind him in confusion, he turns to see her legs dangling. The creature is right above the duke and asks him why he killed it. It turns out to be a demon and attacks Rashad. Sena sees that he has frightened the duke again. The evil power will not retreat. The ceiling starts to collapse, but you manage to jump out of the room. The girl sees that the duke is delirious again. He says that he did not want to kill Siren. Sena tells him to close his eyes, because everything he sees now is not real, but an illusion. She says she will leave now, but she'll be back soon. And very quickly the girl fulfills her promise by saying that it's all over now, so don't worry. And she caught the disgusting creature. Sedna says it is because of a small bee-like pest called avalakas, which are quite rare and can cause illusions. These insects use their stingers to wound their prey and look into their terrors. And then they project these nightmares into the real world as illusions. And while the victim is in oblivion, they absorb their energy and in some cases can even eat the victim's body. Rashad asks how she defeated this demon. The girl says that she is a hunter and her specialty is demons that affect the mind. The duke finds himself thinking that all this time he thought the girl could only be aggressive, but she turns out to be pretty as well. Rashad suggests that Sena leave as soon as possible. She agrees, saying that the sun will rise soon. She helps him to get up. People are already gathered outside and they hear something collapsing. Some think it is an earthquake. Sena tries to reassure them, saying that nothing serious has happened, that the floor has just collapsed because the house is very old and there is nothing to worry about. Suddenly Ellen walks into the crowd. She asks Sena if she is alright and tells her that she could have been seriously hurt. She apologizes and says she didn't want Ellen to worry. The girl asks Sena what she was doing in his highness's house. Sena is a little embarrassed but says she was helping him. Ellen understands and says she will leave. Suddenly Aaron appears and rushes to his highness. He begins to shake the duke and asks how this could have happened to him. He says that if his highness is going to continue to get into such trouble, then Aaron asks that he at least be allowed to be near the duke. Rashad tells the boy to stop and asks him to look at something for him. 
He asks Sena to show him this small bee-like monster. Aaron asks what the demon is doing here. The Duke tells the boy to go back and have this insect examined immediately, and he also tells Aaron to call a doctor. Sena asks why a doctor is needed. In fact, it is necessary because Sena has been burned, which is not surprising for one who has worked with the Mana Stone. The Duke tries to help her treat the injury, but she is somewhat embarrassed and says she will do it herself. The Mana Stone is a tool that allows those without enough mana to control magic. However, there are rare cases when a person is incompatible with magic. Such people cannot use the Mana Stone. Sena is such a case. When people use a Mana Stone to control magic, the stone turns black when it runs out of mana. Despite this limitation, Sena still found a way to use the stone. She made the mana in the stone flow out instantly, and then she used it as an explosive. Still, Sena wondered how the demon had gotten into the capital. She had never heard of a demon breaking through the barrier surrounding the city in hundreds of years. Rashad asks the girl if this happens a lot. Sena says it does, but she is a hunter and feels she is repaying his debt. She reminds him that it was thanks to him that she escaped from prison that time but she does not think that her help repaid him 600,000 rupees. The duke assures her that she has repaid him, and her help was worth even more. After all, she saved his life, so he says that if she needs anything from him, anything at all, she can just let him know. Sena says that in that case she wants to know the details of what she learned about the demon, but Rashid cannot tell her. Sena is indignant, but reminds him that he said she could ask him anything. The duke says anything but that. Sena says that she is both a hunter and a native, not to mention that the demon appeared near her home, so she has every right to know why. But Irashad still refuses to talk about it. Sena says that this demon has invaded the capital and asks if anyone is worried that it will happen again. But the duke still refuses to speak of it. Sena is very angry with him. At this point Aaron brings in the doctor who notices that things seem a little tense and asks if anything is wrong. Now Sena is angry with him. She assures herself that she has other sources of information, and her connections. After bandaging her arm, Samsa goes home, thinking that although the demon was of low rank, the fact of his appearance has not been annulled, and the fact that he entered the capital means that something has happened to the barrier. The entire empire would be in chaos if this event became known, and that is probably why the duke is trying to hide it. Suddenly someone approaches the girl. For some reason she did not feel him before he came very close to her. He takes her hand and Sani thinks she is thinking deeply, but not so deeply that she has forgotten what is going on around her. A man's voice asks if she is hurt, and it sounds familiar. She turns to see Dion standing in front of her. For some reason she relaxes. Maybe it's because she didn't think she could meet him here, or maybe it's because she hasn't seen him in two days. Come to think of it, she hadn't seen Dion since that day. All her thoughts had been occupied with the situation with Marcel and the Duke, and she had forgotten all about him. The boy asks if she is hurt. Sani thinks that he has become completely different in just one second, like two completely different people. Dion is still holding the girl's hand and asks what happened. Sani says it was just a little accident, nothing more. The boy asks what kind of accident leaves a wound all over a person's palm. At this point the girl remembers that Dion is the chairman's son, and he must have heard something about demons. She asks the boy if he is free at the moment. They decide to go to a cafe. Dion buys Sena a meal and asks her if she likes the food. She says that she really didn't want him to buy her food, but just wanted to talk to him. The boy says that it's lunchtime anyway, so it's okay. Sena immediately asks if it's true that a demon has invaded the capital and says that it could be much more serious than it seems at first glance. And that's why she asks Dion to tell her if he finds out anything about demons. The boy agrees. Sena notices how gracefully Dion uses a table knife. He seems to be well-trained in all areas. But who has she seen this time? Does he have a split personality? Suddenly the boy tells Sena that she reminds him of something. The boy tells her that she should never have anything to do with the Duke again from this day on. Because her first meeting with him didn't go well enough and she's probably already heard the gossip about him. So it's best for her to stay away from him. Sena says that she is not sure. She says that the Duke is first of all her neighbor and secondly that he has helped her a lot in the past. The girl says that she holds no grudge against him for this meeting, and she thinks that the duke does not seem to be a bad person. His men even helped Helen when a thief broke into her house. It turns out that Dion doesn't know about the incident with the thief, and Sany tells him everything. The girl asks him if he's sure he doesn't want to see Helen. He says he's still thinking about it. Sana thinks that Dion is very nervous about seeing Helen, 
and that it doesn't matter what his real identity is, because she thinks that his feelings for Helene are still sincere. This is also true if it all turns out to be an act, then he can be considered a brilliant actor. Theon offers the girl to taste his steak, which he cut especially for her because she had injured her hand. After this proposal, Senu does not care that he may have several personalities. He asks the girl what she is doing in the afternoon. The girl says that she will probably go to the library to see if there is any information about the demon that invaded the capital. The boy asks if she wants him to go with her. Sena says that it is alright and that he has already done enough for her by giving her such an expensive meal. Dion says that she can hardly use a table knife properly because of her injured hand and that she needs his help. Sena says that he is probably right. They go to the library together. Although it was not part of the girl's plans, she actually wanted to try to learn something about the details of demons from the Knights of the Guard. But she would stand out too much from the crowd if she walked around the capital with Dion following her. Still, Dion can help her in her search for information, so she should be satisfied with that for now. Sena shows her hunting license. The librarian greets her by name. Dion then shows his identity card. And she also tells him that she is glad to see him, saying his name. And that name is Russell Dorr. This guy is always amazed by Sena. For some reason Dion does not talk about the confusion of his names. Although it would be interesting for Sena to know. Is this guy really the real Dion? After all, she's only heard it from a few hunters. The girl assumes that this is not the real Dion, but a fake. Suddenly the boy tells Sena that he has something to tell her. The girl thought he would tell her something about his name. But the boy says he hates libraries. He might even fall asleep while reading the books, but he asks that they never find him without them. Dion says he hates books. Saini tells him to forget it and suddenly says he wants to know who Russell Dorr is. The boy says his father ordered the subscription for him and he doesn't know who the name belongs to either. Dion says that he is not really a registered hunter. Many people are suspicious of him because he is the eldest son of the chief, and that is why he does not want to be a hunter because he does not intend to take his father's place. Saini says she did not even know this, but she thinks the chief really cares about him, because he even made him a fake ID. The boy says he is not sure. The girl sees that he gets completely depressed at the mere mention of his father. She thinks that she should avoid mentioning him as much as possible. Dion helps Sena to get a book from a high shelf and asks her if she isn't glad that he came with her because she really needed his help. It is a book by Elliot Ruffman that describes psychic demons. The girl says that this author has spent his life searching for and studying demons. When Dion opens the book and begins to read it, it sounds like a love story. Saini reads the subtitle, which reads a study of the irresistible temptations of the succubi. Dion says that this author must have been very devoted to his work. The girl leaves Dion, cursing Elliot Ruffman, whom she had thought so highly of. They think that the fact that she took this book with her will give the impression that she ran away to read nonsense all alone. Saini thinks what's the use of being so nervous now. She's already given him the wrong impression, so he might as well read the book now. Still, she has a lot to thank the author for. Considering the nature of the subject, it was all so vulgar, but at least he had organized it. The girl also finds a description of the demon she captured last night. Although he is hardly mentioned, this creature does not live in their area, nor is it strong enough to break through the barrier of the capital. In that case, someone might have caught it and deliberately let it in. While the girl was reading the book, the sun had already set. She wonders if Dion has gone home yet and decides to look for him. Suddenly she sees a hooded man with purple hair showing, muttering as he looks at a piece of paper. She realizes that this is the same suspicious man who came to meet Helene and of whom Dion spoke. She follows the man and sees him enter the room where the forbidden books are kept. Saini thinks that if he turns out to be one of those watching Helene to harm her, he will definitely get into trouble with her. She wants to know what this man is doing. She continues to watch the man, but for some reason, he turns and walks towards her. The girl decides to hide as soon as possible, but suddenly someone grabs her from behind. Saini shouts at him to let her go, but then she realizes that it was Dion. Suddenly the hooded man calls out to the other man, calling him master. They meet, and the other man, who is also hooded and has a walking stick, says that it seems that Duke Rashad has begun to suspect something, and first they must find this child, and they must get Helen. Saini knew that the Marquis of Euclid had been watching Helene. She remembers a little of what happened at the beginning of the story. While living with the Marquis family, Helene had to endure many sufferings. She can confidently call them all bad people, except the Marquis of Euclid himself. When it came to him, Helene could not use specific words like bad or good in his direction. After all, the Marquis was indeterminate. The members of the Euclid household did not even treat her as a human being just because she was an illegitimate child. 
As soon as they had a chance to beat, humiliate, or abuse her, they did not hesitate to use it. But although Helene was hated by everyone, there was one person who gave her a room, clothes, food, and maids. And this was the Marquis of Euclid. Yet he never came to meet Helene in person. It seemed that the Marquis, unlike the rest of the family, wanted to deny the girl's existence altogether. No matter how much his wife and children humiliated Helene, the Marquis never did anything to stop them. But at the same time, he never harmed her. It was as if Ellen did not exist in the eyes of the Marquis. If the Marquis had really been like this all the time, why did he suddenly decide to find her? The man with the cane asks the man with the purple hair about the girl in the flower shop who looks like Ellen. The boy says that he has seen her, but that she is not Ellen. He says that when they first came to see her, the girl was very kind and sweet, just like Ellen. But the second time she attacked his servant with a broom and drove him away. He says that the third time he saw her he was finally convinced that this girl could not be Ellen. One day Saini told Ellen that if she wanted to survive in this dangerous world, she would have to learn some swear words. So she taught the girl these words, and told her that if she thought she saw one of the duke's men, she should tell him what Saina had taught her. The boy with the purple hair told his master that the girl cursed a lot, which was very unlike Ellen, but he thinks he should visit her again to be sure. The boy says that this time he will disguise himself so that the girl will not recognize him. After this conversation, the two suspicious hooded men go to the library. Dion asks Sana how she got the idea to teach Helene to swear. The girl asks how he knew it was her. The boy says that her expression gave it away. In general, he has a lot of fun with Sana. Sana asks the boy if he is not worried that the Marquis is looking for the girl. After all, he probably wants to take her away. But Dion says nothing and looks at Sana. The girl asks why he looks at her like that. Dion apologizes if she feels uncomfortable. He says it's nothing like that, it's just the way he is when he's around her. The time passes surprisingly quickly and he really has a lot of fun with the girl. He doesn't seem to care much about Ellen's fate, which is very strange for someone who is in love with her. The guy offers to drive her home if she has finished her business here. Sani comes to Anna for advice, wondering how to understand Dion's behavior. Anna says there is only one answer, he doesn't love her anymore. Sani says that this cannot be true because he said that this girl was his first love whom he was crazy about for a long time. Anna says that in this case he is just trying not to think about her so that he can let go and move on. Sana hasn't told Anna who these questions are about, and Anna is very curious. Sana says that this story is not about her at all, but she is just telling something that concerns her friend. The girl says that what she really wanted to ask Anna was whether someone from the police was here. Anna says that they are all away on business. It is very strange that the entire department is not in the guild now, and Sana thinks that perhaps the Duke is deliberately limiting the ability to contact people involved in the search in order to cover up this criminal activity. Anna says that maybe there is a mistake in the report or they have already returned and suggests that Sana go upstairs and wait for them. She thinks that they have made it clear that they are not interested in negotiating with anyone by suddenly leaving on business. On the third floor, where the detective department's office is located, Sani thinks her door is locked, but it is surprisingly open. When the girl enters the office, she sees Dion there. The boy says she came earlier than he expected. Sana is surprised to see him here and asks what he is doing. Dion says he is here waiting for her. Dion recalls that on the way home the girl said she wanted to go to the police station. But Sana didn't mean that she wanted to meet him here today. The girl asks how he opened the door or if it was already open. Dion tells her that he opened it with a key that he himself had stolen from a magician at the police station. And he gives this key to Sana, who holds it in her wounded hand. Without missing a beat, they decide to search the documents in the office. They actively search for a report on the demon they found in the Duke's house. It takes them a long time to find it. Dion says that there is no way that the detective division could have missed such an important case. Sana says that they are definitely hiding the report and probably won't tell them anything even if they ask. When they decide that the search is futile, Sana asks the boy if it is true that he has given up on Ellen. Dion says that it is true and that he has decided to let her go. Sana tells the boy not to be upset, that he is a very good man and will make the best husband to a wonderful woman. Dion asks the girl if she can help him feel better. Sana says she is afraid she won't be able to make him laugh this time. But the boyfriend laughs and asks if she really thinks he will ask her to do such a thing. In fact, he just wants her to stay with him. The girl asks if he wants her to do that tonight. He says that he probably needs a little more than a day to feel better. Sana thinks that he wants her to sit with him every time he feels sad. She thinks this is normal for someone who has recently been heartbroken, and that he just needs a friend to help him forget the pain. 
Dion asks if they are still together tonight. How about going out to dinner together? The girl says that she is very busy with work today, so she suggests that they do it another time. They decide it's time to leave before anyone else comes in and put the place back the way it was before they came here to look for the report. Suddenly they hear someone approaching the office. Dion says they can just go. When this person passes by, Sana asks Dion what he was thinking when he tried to leave at that moment, and what if someone sees them. The boy says that they could tell them that they have an emergency. The girl realizes that it is not a good idea to hit the boss's son for saying that, and she needs to calm down. She asks Dion if he knows how attractive he is, and with his looks he will always attract attention. But the boy just laughs. Sana asks what made him laugh. Dion apologizes but says he didn't know she thought he was handsome. He promises to be more careful from now on, but asks her to keep her promise as well. He remembers that the girl promised to make him feel better. Sana promises to see that she keeps her promise. The next day, Dion comes to Sana's house and asks if they can go out to eat to make him feel better. The girl has just woken up and says that it is only 12 in the afternoon. Dion asks if it is time for lunch. He takes her hand and leads her to eat. The next day the boyfriend comes at 1 because last time she said 12 was too early. He promises not to force her out of the house this time. After that day, he suggests that she go to a new dessert cafe. The next day he asks her if she likes western food because he wants to try it tonight. Then Sana suggested that he come in first because she had to clean the house today. And Dion didn't even hesitate to go in. She also didn't know that this promise meant that she would spend every day with him. She hadn't even had time to start her investigation about the demon and the marquee, and she hadn't even found a job yet. Suddenly there was a knock at the door. Dion offers to open it himself, and when he does, he sees Duke Rashad standing at the door. He closes the door abruptly and with a bang without saying anything. Sejna nevertheless invites the Duke in and gives him tea. The Duke tells the girl that he has come to make a deal with her. Dion protests, and an argument ensues. Rashad asks her why she invited Dion, and Dion asks her why she invited Rashad to her house. The girl breaks down and says loudly that it is because it is her house and she can do whatever she wants because it is her place, and she can escort them out if she wants to. After these words there was silence. Sana suddenly asks His Excellency what proposal he has for her. Herzog says that he knows the basement of his new house is not in very good condition. He wanted to fix it, but was told that the basement was not the only problem, so he decided to fix the whole house while he was at it. It will probably take a month or two. Sana wonders if this means that no one will protect Helene until then, since Dion is also leaving her. The Duke says that is his suggestion. He wants to rent her house while his own is being built. He does not mean that he needs the whole house, but only one room, and he promises to pay very generously, and then they can even make a contract. Dion clearly protests. Rashad shows the contract he prepared. Dion asks him not to say that she is actually thinking of renting the rooms to him. The Duke says he can pay more if necessary. For now, he offers 500,000 rupees a month. When the girl sees the amount, she immediately welcomes the Duke into the house, calling him a precious guest. The amount of money is more than her salary for the year, and if she allows the Duke to stay here, he will be able to help Helen if she is in trouble. Sana wants to sign the contract, but Dion tells her not to and that he will not accept it. He says he can also give her 500,000 rupees. Sana asks why he is doing this. Suddenly, Rashad says that he has been wondering about their relationship for some time. Sana says that this is a very strange question, and of course they are only friends. Dion doesn't want them to be just friends. Rashad says if she thinks they are just friends, who is he to argue? He leaves the contract and asks her to think about it. Sana asks why he is leaving. The Duke says he wants to give her enough time to think about it. He adds that the girl can offer her own terms if she wishes, and bids her farewell. The girl thinks that he has become much kinder than when they first met. He has just suddenly changed or something. Whatever it is, we finally have to look at this contract. Even though it doesn't seem like he's missed anything at first, there are some terms missing. And she begins to add much more to this contract. Sani asks Dion what he thinks and if it's enough. The boy turns away and asks why she is asking him since he is just a friend. The girl wonders if he was upset because she said they were just friends. Dion asks if she is really going to sign this contract. And the girl says of course she is, because she needs the money. The boy asks why. The last time the Duke wanted her to sell him the house, she refused without hesitation. Rashad had offered a large sum of money then, too. Sani says that this time the circumstances are completely different. He is not asking her to sell the house outright, but only to rent it for a while. Now he does not even demand it as he did last time. Dion says that she is right, but he can also give her that kind of money. 
The girl replies that it is not only about money, she wants a duke. The boy asks what that means. Sana remembers how the thief broke into Helen's house. Had it not been for the duke's men, the girl might have been in serious danger. Besides, according to what they heard from the Marquis, the man with the purple hair will visit Helen again. But if the duke stays here, Ellen will at least avoid the worst. She wonders if this is what the boy meant when he said that Helene would be better off with the duke. And he did mean it. Dion concludes that, in other words, she decided to accept Rashad's offer because of what he said. Sany sees that the boy is very upset. A few days later, the duke moves into Sany's house. The girl thinks that his room has a very nice view of Ellen's house. She hopes that nothing will happen to the girl but she thinks she shouldn't worry about Ellen because she's just a neighbor. Maybe Sana is so worried about her because Ellen is the main character in the novel, or because she feels sorry for the girl who had to run away from her horrible family. Or perhaps she is just too sensitive. When the workers have moved all of the Duke's belongings, he appears. Sany asks if he really hasn't forgotten their terms. Rashad says there is no way he could have forgotten them because the girl has reminded him of them at least a million times. Sana says it is time to test how well he has remembered them. The man begins to list all the conditions. First, never go to the second floor. Second, do not touch closed doors. Third, any broken or damaged property must be replaced. Fourth, do not bring pets. Fifth, it is better to use the back door. And the last, sixth, only three of his people can enter the house at a time. And finally, all weapons and people who enter the house must be checked by the housewife. And if any of the conditions is violated, the contract is considered null and void. Sana says that he has remembered everything very well and welcomes him home. Suddenly Aaron appears and asks if he can come too. The girl says of course he can and she is happy that he is here. The boy points to Dion and asks who he is. The duke says that he is a friend of Sana's. Dion, hiding his hatred for Rashad, approaches him and says that he hopes he will enjoy his time here. The duke shakes the boy's hand and says that he hopes he will too. Aaron tells Sana that his highness plans to be here only once or twice a week, and that his knights will come on the other days. The boy says that is all he has to say and leaves. Dion and Rashad begin to quarrel again, but Sana stops them. She tells Dion that it is getting dark and he should go home. The girl takes the boy to the door to say goodbye, but for some reason the door doesn't open. Dion asks her what they should do and she tells him that it looks like he won't be going home tonight because the door is stuck. So the three of them stayed in the same house. Not only were the doors locked, but the windows were locked as well, as if they were closed within a barrier. Dion says it's not so bad, and then he'll probably sleep here tonight, too. The girl reports that they are dealing with a demon. They have to find it. But first they have to find out what kind of monster it is. The girl cannot believe that evil has entered her home. She vows to protect her home. Sana hits the window pane with all her might. He asks if it is not strange that she hit the window very hard, but there is not a single scratch on it. The demon locked her in here because it is easier to catch living prey that is in captivity. The company is getting hotter and hotter. Sana says that this must be a very rare type of monster, and he does all this. It seems that this demon likes its prey cooked. The girl says she read about this monster in a book by Elliot Ruffman. It talked about a demon that liked to steam its prey before eating it. And on the next page it talked about the devil they found in the duke's house. And if they knew more about this creature, it would be very useful now. Suddenly Dion suggests they calm down and drink some water. Sana asks where he got the cold water. The boy says that he actually has a few tricks up his sleeve. And he can make water with magic. The girl notices that Dion's tattoo on his right arm is visible through his shirt. After drinking the cold water, they actually feel better. The Duke asks if he has a better method because it will take them forever to cool down at this rate. Dion says he has more fireballs in his supply for him if that's what he wants. He asks if he still needs a glass of water, why not try asking for it sincerely? Sana asks him to stop and stresses that they need to concentrate on finding the demon in this house. According to what she read in the book, the creature will hide until it dies of heat. The girl ties up her hair and says that since she only saw it once in the book, she is not sure where it might be hiding. She asks Dion if he knows anything about the creature. The boy says he doesn't know much about demons and has never fought one. The girl wonders how this can be, since all of the chief's other children are high-ranking hunters. Suddenly the question arises in Sana's mind. How do they know each other? Dion says that they met for the first time in her house. Rashad adds that Dion had passed by him once, and his friend had told the duke about the boy. And this friend said it was better to stay away from Dion. As they ascend to the second floor, Sana's device reacts more and more to the demon. Suddenly the girl falls. Dion catches her and tells her to wake up. Rashad says she won't wake up because the heat stroke has successfully reached her. 
Ian asks if he should throw ice water on her. Sena says she doesn't want to clean it up later. The boy asks the duke what they should do now. Rashad says they will have to see for themselves. Catching the demon quickly is the best way to help her. She told them not to enter her room without asking, but Rashad is sure she will understand in this case. Suddenly, in one of the rooms, Dion comes across a map with a pencil mark on it. Suddenly Sena begins to fly in the air and Dion and the duke notice it. This means that the demon has swallowed the girl. Rashad stabs where the demon's head should be, knowing that Sena should be in its stomach. He cuts off the creature's tongue, but it grows back. Dion tries to wound the monster with ice arrows, but the demon runs down the stairs. It leaves traces of its saliva. Dion asks Rashad to pull himself together, for if they delay any longer, Sena is in danger of being digested. Since this monster prepares its victims, Dion suggests that the duke pretend to be her, and the moment the demon opens its mouth to eat him, the boy will use his magic. Rashad thinks that Dion is the only one who needs to pull himself together. But the boy is out of ideas. Dion has only one option, to blow up the house, but they can imagine how Sena would react. Suddenly Dion elbows the salt. It falls on the creature's tracks and they begin to hiss. The duke realizes at once that this is the monster's weak point. He notices that its saliva has turned black from contact with the salt. Dion suddenly has an idea. The duke is now lying on the floor covered in salt and Dion is hiding behind the sofa. Rashad clearly does not like this plan. Suddenly the monster's footprints begin to appear. It sticks out its tongue to eat the duke. At this point Dion puts a bag of salt in its mouth. Rashad then chops off the monster's head. Now it seems to be over, but where is Sena? Suddenly the monster moved. Dion realized what had happened to Sena and that the creature could regenerate. Rashad asks how to kill it. Dion says that demons like it have a core. In other words, a crystal that feeds them. You can only kill this creature by destroying the crystal or by getting it. Dion keeps the monster's mouth open with magic, and all will be well until it disappears. He asks the duke what he is waiting for and tells him to go in and free Sena. Rasad was reluctant, but he decided to do it. If he does not go in, the demon will eat the girl, and after regeneration he can grow and become larger. The duke had already entered the monster's mouth when he suddenly touched the ice on which the mouth rested. The monster immediately regenerates and swallows the duke. That is why Dion told him to hurry. The boy uses fire magic against the creature. Suddenly the monster stopped. Rasad and Sejna flew out of its mouth, and the monster fell to the ground. The duke has found the crystal inside the creature, and so it simply vanished into the wind. You try to wake the girl. She just hugs Rashad and says in a barely understandable voice that they should let her sleep more. The boys excitedly tell Sena that she has to wake up. She continues to hug the duke and addresses him as her mother, saying that there is no school today and that she wants to sleep longer. Dion takes Sena away from Rashad and tells the girl that she shouldn't press herself against a pervert, and that she should hug him instead. Sena wakes up in a strange room. She immediately sees the girl next to her, dressed as a maid, and is glad that she is finally awake, saying that they were worried about her because she had been sleeping for quite a while. The girl says that this is the palace of Duke Rashad and that his highness brought her here. Sena realized that she had fainted because of the fever. The maid tells her that his highness brought her here because she fainted, and they have a doctor so it was easier to wash her. The girl is amazed that they have washed her. The maid continues, saying that the duke warned them that she would not like them washing her unconscious in the bathroom, so they just wiped her with a towel. The girl says she will prepare a bath for Sena. The girl felt much better after the bath. Dion and Rashad came to see her, and she said that she remembered nothing after she fainted. Dion asks her if she doesn't remember hugging his highness, and judging by her reaction, she does. Dion tells us what Sena said when she hugged the duke. The girl apologizes to Rashad and says she did not know what she was doing. The duke says there is nothing wrong with it. Sena wants to discuss something serious with Rashad. She wants him to tell her why all these demons appear in her house. Rashad says he cannot tell her because he is still trying to find out for himself. He knew something was going to happen, but he didn't think it would be a demon. He needs more time to find out. The Duke promises to tell both Sena and Dion as soon as he knows all the details. When Rashad leaves and meets Aaron, he asks him seriously what is going on with the lady of the house. Aaron tells him that all the maids say that they have never seen his highness look at anyone with such care. Meanwhile, Sena asks Dion what he thinks of the recent events. The capital is the safest place in the kingdom, because the most talented magicians, hunters, and scientists have joined together to build the barrier that protects it. And yet demons have somehow found a way to get in. Dion believes that the duke does not tell them everything, not because he does not trust them, but because there may be secrets that are too dangerous to know. Sena says even if that's the reason, she can't just sit back and do nothing. 
This is her home and she must do everything in her power to protect it. Demons are the sworn enemies of the hunters, so she can't just let it go. If another demon shows up, she'll find out the truth and then destroy them the second she does. Eon thinks that only Sena could say such a thing and tells the girl that it's time for him to go back. Sena decides to stay a little longer because she has something else she wants to ask the duke. Not to mention that she would also like to try the food served in the palace. Before leaving, Dion tells the girl that her house is damaged. And quite badly. This information makes the girl very nervous. Nevertheless, Aaron continues to question Rashad about his relationship with the landlady. Even though the duke wants him to stop talking. Suddenly, the maids enter the duke's office and say that the guests are leaving. Rashad thinks that Sena has decided to leave and will stay at least for dinner. The Duke remembers that she apologized for hugging him and thinks that she does not like being around him, but that she always feels good around Dion. Rashad asks his assistant James to find out what kind of gifts girls like. He wants to get Sena a gift. James asks if it is for Ellen. Rashad remembers that he had completely forgotten about her. The Duke decides to go to Sena at once, but the assistant reminds him that he has a lot of work to do today, and Rashad decides to finish it. And in the evening he decides to go to the girl, and he has a reason for this, to look after Helen. When the Duke arrives at Sane's house, Dion opens the door for him. Rashad thinks that the boy behaves as if it were his house. Inside, the Duke is received by Sena. She tells him that she has restored some order here, because before it was a complete mess, the whole house was covered with demon spit and it wasn't easy, she still can't clean it. Luckily, only the box was broken. The Duke says it must have cost a lot, but Sena asks him not to worry, because she had sold the mana stone they had taken from the demon and got as much as 400,000 rupees for it. And Dion helped her sell it. The girl offered him his share, but Rasad refused. Sena asked Dion if he had any complaints during his sleep. He said that he did not, and that he enjoyed it very much. The girl tells him that Dion was a little tired from helping her clean the house, so she gave him a room to sleep in. But she is worried because the room she gave him has been empty for 10 years, and yet she is glad that he had a good night's sleep. Dion says that, surprisingly, it was very clean. Sena says that her grandfather used to live in this room, but she cleans it every day, so it is in good condition. Dion apologizes and says he didn't mean to cause her any trouble. The girl says that there is no such thing, and she is sure that her grandfather would not mind, considering how much he has helped her. Rashad listens to the two of them chatting nicely and asks what work needs to be done around the house. He also wants to help with the cleanup because he thinks it is his fault that their house was damaged. Dion tells the duke that he can cook dinner in that case. Sena thinks the dignitary probably doesn't know how to cook, but the duke says he does. Rashad is trying very hard to prepare dinner. Dion hopes the duke will be alright afterwards. The duke had never cooked before, and he probably always ate only what his servants prepared for him. Sena offers to do the cooking, but Rashad says he will do it himself. The girl stops him, however, and says that he is here to eat, and she cannot force her guest to work. Sena takes the duke's knife and asks him to let her do everything herself. Rashad offers to cook with her. She agrees and starts chopping vegetables. The duke decides to start with the other ingredients. Sena adds the chopped food to the pot. She remembers that she forgot to add the butter first and adds it after the vegetables, thinking that it doesn't matter in what order they are added. She also decides to add some wine. The girl says that it will be a stew with meat. Rashad says that this dish should be cooked very slowly and gradually. Sena says that it is, but they are all very hungry now, so she had to cook it on high heat to make it cook faster. The duke says that she hasn't even added the meat yet. The girl remembers that this is true and says that she will do it now. Suddenly, Rashad stops her and asks if she has a cookbook at home. Sena says that it might be on the shelf in the living room, but she adds that they don't need the book right now. The duke says he just wants to look at it, that's all. The girl agrees to bring the book and says she is almost certain it will tell the robot exactly what she is doing. The duke looks at the pot and can't believe the girl has cooked it to eat. When Sena comes into the living room, Dion asks her if she has finished cooking. She tells him that his highness wants to see her cookbook. After a while, Rashad prepares a new dish. Dion says it looks pretty good. Sena says that this dish is much better than her own and calls the duke a wonderful cook. Rashad says that he just followed the instructions in the book. The girl says that his slicing has also improved. The duke says that this is probably because he knows how to use a sword, and he quickly got used to the kitchen knife. He suggests that they start eating before the food gets cold. Dion says he can't believe he lived to see this day. He never thought he would be eating stew prepared by the duke himself. Suddenly Sena puts a stew she has prepared on the table. 
She asks them to taste both dishes and tell her which is better. She is also confident in her cooking skills. Dion puts a spoonful in his mouth and says that it tastes amazing so as not to offend the girl. But he seems to like the Duke's dish better. Saina likes it too. And Dion is already asking for a second helping. Rashad thinks it seems like an eternity since he shared a meal with others. After all, he has no family or friends to share his food with. Saina says that he must be a duke for a reason and that he is good at everything. After dinner, they go shopping to buy the things the demon broke in Saina's house. Suddenly, they notice a statue in the shape of a dragon. The shopkeeper told them that it was called the dragon protecting the mana stone. Dion likes this piece of art very much, and Saina thinks it looks like something that belongs in the house of a demon king. The vendor says that he made it himself, and Dion really admires his work. The man says that he probably just loves dragons, and Dion has liked them since he was a child. Dragons are mythical creatures, so no one has ever seen them in real life, but the details of this piece just amaze Dion. The vendor says that they may still exist somewhere, and the legend that they can use magic may be true. Dion asks if magic comes from demons. The vendor says it's just a theory but demons could actually be dragons. The man behind the counter says that people don't like demons, but asks if it's strange that they use magic that belongs to them. In order for humans to use magic, a bond had to be established between the two races, and the merchant is sure that one of the races was dragons. In all fairy tales dragons are always friendly to men, and he asks what would happen if the demons were divided in their opinions, with the result that some decided to remain in demon form because they disliked men and others made a pact with men and became dragons. A man doubts that all demons are evil and bring bad luck. Dion says that this idea will surely make the temple angry, but Saina doesn't care. Why should she care about dragons she has never seen in her life? Such talk is also very dangerous. They cause confusion in the community because they are in a sacred realm. Although it sounds quite plausible, the salesman says he is glad to see a young man who is interested in the stories of the past and this dragon lamp is perfect for people like him. The girl says she will buy this lamp, only she thinks that this situation looks like a mother buying a toy for her spoiled son. Saina says that there are many people here. The shopkeeper says they are probably here to see a play nearby and asks why they shouldn't see it while they are here. The company decides to go to the theater. Rashad and Dion enjoy the play, and for some reason Saina remembers going to the theater with her grandmother. She thinks she should have smiled more that day. Dion sees that she is a little gloomy and asks what is wrong and if she doesn't like the play. Saina says that everything is fine. To Dion, however, it sounds like she's lying. A strange man in a robe was in the audience that day. The next day, Dion and Rashad read the book on which the play was based. Saina demands that they stop reading during the meal. They seem very much affected by the play. Saina has kept this novel because it was written by her grandmother's favorite author. The girl tells them to eat, but she has to go to the guild. The boys argue about who will read the next part of the book. As Rashad and Dion see her off, she remembers how her grandparents used to see her off when she went out. They seem to have become a family. At the guild, Anna says that it has become very boring here because there is much less work than last year. She is afraid of losing her job. The girl tells Saina that she has no work for her now. Saina wonders if this is what Anna wanted to talk about. Saina tells Anna not to worry because she has recently made a lot of money. Anna is curious as to how she did it. The girl thinks that if she were to tell her, she would say that she lives next door to the main character of this fictional world. And one day a candidate for the main male role appeared from somewhere and asked her to rent a room. Since it was his job to protect this girl, she agreed. He said he would pay as much as 500,000 rupees a month, and while they talked, he read a cheap romance novel at her place. Then Anna would have been a little embarrassed and asked Saina what she was talking about and if she was crazy. The girl decides that she must never tell the truth. Suddenly she remembers the person with purple hair who followed Helene and that she forgot to warn her to be very careful. Saina hopes that the Duke will not be so carried away by the love affair that he neglects the danger to the heroine. The girl begins to worry, and Anna asks if she is all right. Anna sees that Saina will not tell her where she got the money and asks if she is not going to take the order yet. Saina says that she probably will, as she has been very busy lately. Anna asks if it is because of Dion Frabble. She says that there have been some interesting rumors about her lately, but Saina stops her and asks her not to talk about it. Suddenly a boy named Robin enters the room and speaks to Saina. He says that he is very happy to see her and that he has some great news for her. Robin shows her a piece of paper and says that they have an assignment. And it's not even very dangerous. Saina is shown five babies and the hunters don't know whose children they are and they were found on the street. 
even though they live in a very bad time. It is very strange how five children could be lost at once. This cannot be a coincidence. As she walks home in the evening, Sena worries about whether the police will be able to take care of the children properly. She thinks maybe she should have stayed with them another day, but she decides it is okay because she has done enough. She should hurry home as the Duke and Dion are probably waiting for her. The girl comes home and says that she is already there. Suddenly she sees a little boy who looks very much like Dion in his clothes, which are too big for this child. She sees that the Duke has also become a little boy, but they are still arguing about who will read the next part of the novel, of which Sena has only one copy. What the girl sees makes her laugh. She asks if they were so absorbed in the novel that they hadn't noticed how young they had become. Sejna says that, by a strange coincidence, children also appeared at the police station. Rashad asks if there is a rejuvenation spell. Dion is sure there is, but if it were magic, he would know about it. Sena says the demon is to blame. She thought it was the stuff of legends because it was as rare as dragons. This is the third time a demon has appeared near their house. Dion asks if this demon is mentioned in Elliot Ruffman's book. The girl says that there was something about him and that she will go to the library tomorrow morning and read the book again. She asks if they would like to stay with her for a while. The next day Sena bought the boys new clothes that fit them. She thinks that Dion must be about 7 years old and the Duke about 12. While she is helping Dion put on the clothes that are a little too big for him, someone knocks at the door. Without waiting for an answer, Aaron burst into the house and asked the girl if she had seen his highness, for he had not been able to find him anywhere since yesterday morning. Sena tells him that she thinks the last time she saw him was when he was doing some research. While Aaron and Sena talk, the boys hide in another room. The boy says that now is his real vacation. The Duke doesn't like the fact that his assistant has taken a vacation so easily, but he can't tell the truth because it hurts his pride. In the library they find the name of the demon, Revolute. He is an S-class psychic demon. He likes to cast curses just for fun and those he has cursed begin to grow younger, both physically and mentally. As time passes, they become younger and younger, and unable to break the curse, the victims die. Dion assures Sena that he and the Duke will be fine. The boy notices that the curse consumes the demon's mana first. That is why it does not work on priests. Mages and other magical creatures also receive only minor changes. Those who use aura stop growing younger in adolescence, but if a magician stops using aura during this period, he will quickly become a small child. The book also says that this demon was once the pet of a devil, and that is why he is so fond of harming people. Whoever caresses Ravloth is immediately cursed. This is made more difficult by the fact that it is too difficult to get past him in the form of a cute animal. The boys realize that the cat they petted earlier was this Ravalot. They decide to catch the cat. Sena suggests that they ask the hunters for help, saying that Robin already knows all about it and explaining who he is. Suddenly Ellen approaches them in the street with a cat in her arms and asks Sena who the boys next to her are and if they are her cousins. Ellen invites them to tea at her house. While the girls talk, the boys try to catch the cat, which is the demon, but they are not very successful. Ellen tells Sena that her cousins are very energetic. Sena says that is true, but wonders why Helene is not affected by the curse, since she has spent so much time with Revelat. Ellen seems to be endowed with a great deal of divine energy. In their attempt to catch the cat, the boys cause a real disturbance in Ellen's house. Sena shouts at them to stop acting like little children, since they have become younger not only in body but also in spirit. Dion begins to cry like a child who has been scolded by his parents. Sena realizes that she has been too harsh and begins to ask the boys forgiveness. She tells him to look at Sasha, I. The Duke, for whom she has invented a new name on the spot, and says that he is not crying. The girl has to do something about the demon cat in the room with her, and the Duke and Dion have turned into little boys without causing too much panic. Sena seems to be in a somewhat awkward situation. The cat suddenly opens the door. Ellen asks him if he wants to come out and play. The book said this demon looks like a cat. Then Sena realized they might have to check all the cats in town. The Duke then asked what would happen if the demon changed its appearance. The girl said that there was nothing to worry about because she was a hunter, and when a demon was in front of her, she could sense it immediately and find it easily. And the way to capture Revelote was surprisingly simple. The only thing you have to do is to play with him as much as possible. But you must continue to play with him until Revelote calms down. But since Elliot Rathman never met him, the reader will have to discover the time required for this from his own experience. Dion, Rashad, and Sena go after the cat. They chased it for hours, and it turned out that they had increased their stamina since they were children. But Sena fell behind and noticed that they were in an abandoned neighborhood. Some crazy mage had conducted an experiment here, and the whole place was affected by mana. 
did Rivalo lure them here because he felt a demon-like energy? Suddenly the girl hears a child's laughter, which is definitely not like Dion's, and it was definitely not just one voice. Rivalo suddenly appears and tells Sena to play with him. The demon calls the girl by her first name, which frightens her. She decides to show this little piece of fur what the game means. The girl begins to run after him, and the cat tells her to hurry, for if Sena is so slow, he will eat them both. Suddenly she sees the duke floating in the air. Revolute bets that the boy will be killed if he falls from such a height. Sena shouts at the duke to wake up. The boy opens his eyes and finds himself at a great height. And suddenly he begins to fall sharply. Sena sees many dead children around him. She tries to catch Rashad in time. Suddenly Sena turns her attention to Dion. He holds Rashad in the air with his magic. Revolute laughs at Sena, saying that she was so surprised, judging by her amused expression. The cat suggests that they play longer next time, and bids them farewell as he leaves. The girl begins to follow him. She throws a mana stone at the demon. It immediately explodes. Sena picks Rivalo up in her arms. She is surprised that she can do this so easily, since it must be a C-rank demon. The cat begins to move. She knew it, it was just waking up to the fact that it was captured. Revolute says that they haven't seen each other in a long time and asks her not to say that she's still looking for the thing. Kid asks her to tell him what she wants. He says that a girl deserves to have one wish granted when she has won him. Sena says she still has questions. How does he know her? Have they met before? Revolute asks if her wish is the answer to those questions. The girl says that her wish is for him to return everything to the way it was before. Revolute promises to grant her wish. Suddenly Rashad and Dion run up to her, but they are still children. Sena asks the cat why he has not granted her wish. Revolute says that she did not specify when he should grant this wish. He adds that he always keeps his word and bids her farewell. Rashad asks what has happened here. The girl says it is too long a story, and soon they will return to their original form. Suddenly Dion falls to the ground. The boy wakes up at home. He says it's probably just a normal fever that happens when you use too much mana. The boy says that he usually only falls like this when he loses control, but this time his childish body just couldn't handle his usual amount of mana. The doctor said the same. Sena asks Dion if he is not curious as to why the demons keep showing up at their house. Besides, he was in danger this time, and Sena asks him if he doesn't know that out-of-control mana is very difficult to suppress. The boy is very excited to know if she is really so worried about him. Dion lies down on Sena's lap and says that all he needs now is rest and that he is a sick man. The girl thinks it's true that the victims are getting younger and younger, because now Dion is like a little child. She pats the boy's head and lets him lie on her. Sena says he can do whatever he wants, but only today. Sena says this situation reminds her of the past. When her cousins used to visit, they would often talk on this couch until they fell asleep. Dion asks if she really has cousins. The girl says she has three, and she hasn't seen them in a long time. The last time was at her grandfather's funeral. They enjoyed spending time with her. But after her grandfather and his daughters could no longer share the smokehouse, she could no longer see her cousins. Sena wondered how they were. Dion says that it also reminds him of his past. The girl curiously asks what he means. The boy says that his mother died when he was that age. The girl feigns shock and says she is sorry. Dion tells her she doesn't have to act that way. Sena asks if he still has a mentor. Dion says he doesn't know, and in fact the boy hasn't seen him for a long time. The girl thinks she should not have mentioned Dion's mentor. The boy says that he was not the best father and husband anyway. He did not even attend the funeral of Dion's mother, his wife. The boy says that he had enough problems of his own to understand. Sena says that this is not the way to do things and that he did wrong in this case. Dion didn't do anything wrong. The boy asks if Sena knows his father well. The girl cannot say for certain. She has only met him twice, and neither time was pleasant. Sena sees the curiosity in Dion's eyes, although she has already said that she did not like those meetings, and wonders why he is so interested. Still, it's not even a secret, and perhaps he can be told about it. The girl says that the first time she saw him was when her parents disappeared, and her grandfather's colleague was the first to report that it was due to an incident during the mission. The second was a knight, and the third was a mentor. From his face alone, the girl realized how bad things were. Then the mentor said that they were no longer in a position to investigate further, and she thought that in that case she could only wait. As she said, this meeting could have been a little more pleasant. It seems to Sena that this is the first time she has talked with Dion about such a thing. Although they had spent much time together, eating lunch together and sitting at her house, and at the same time, her primary motives for getting closer to him were not entirely unselfish. She simply thought that if she liked her mentor's son, she would be able to find some benefit in it. 
Maybe that would be the way to undo the hunter's downgrade. But now he is not just a friend, he is a very close friend. Sena suggests not mentioning the sad events, and she is sure that the chief has done everything in his power. Suddenly Dion tells Rashad, who is lying beside him, not to wake up from his sleep. One boy asks the other if he really hoped to just lie there without saying anything about himself, and asks if he has no shame at all. The duke does not want to talk about himself. Dion is not surprised that he has no friends, and he will take this into consideration. Rashad suggests that they stop talking and go to bed, because tomorrow they have to go to the library and read about the Book of Revelation. He asks Dion if he isn't afraid that they may never be their age again. Dion doesn't really care. The duke says that he is a very busy man, and Dion has no idea how much he has to do, not to mention keeping his duchy together, and what might happen if he remained in a child's body. Sena says that a few days will make no difference. Aaron is gone. She wants to say something about his parents, but remembers that she doesn't know anything about them. The Duke says that they are dead and that he has no relatives left. They are all in the afterlife. That is why he did not want to tell them anything. Sena apologizes for bringing it up. Rashad says it is all right. She is sure that tomorrow they will go to the library and learn more about the revelation, so she tells them not to worry and to rest well. Sena says that she can easily go three days without sleep, but she thinks that her knees, on which Dion is lying, might not last that long. Rashad can't sleep and asks Sena if she remembers what happened. She asks when exactly. The Duke clarifies that he is talking about the incident with the demon illusion in his basement. He tells her that the girl he saw, named Serena, is his cousin, or rather the daughter of the man who tried to kill him. His uncle was supposed to inherit the duchy, but it so happened that his father became the heir. Since Rashad became duke after his father's death, his uncle despised the boy as much as he could. It came to the point that he wanted to kill him. From that moment on, the duke did not feel safe even in his own estate. The only people who supported him were the butler, the head maid, a few knights and servants. They were the only ones who kept him alive. Of course, his relatives tried to kill the few who sided with him. This made him realize that he had to rely on himself alone. Many things have happened since then, but he didn't kill Siren. Sena asks who did. Rashad says it was his uncle. He would have slaughtered his entire family rather than watch them become a bunch of unwilling slaves. But he was the one who started it all, so he can't say he's completely innocent. The Duke tells Sena that she must now realize that he will not take her home. The girl asks what her home has to do with this. Rashad knows that she has heard gossip about him, so she is worried. Nevertheless, Sena has thought of him as a truly decent man since the signing of the treaty, but she is upset that he is not telling her the reason for the demons in the capital. A duke can take an oath not to harm people without a good reason. Sena seems to think that Rashad thought she was uncomfortable with him all along. The girl asks if he told her about his uncle's secret to reassure her. The duke would not call it a secret because all the nobles already know about it. He says he thought the girl was afraid of him. He remembers that she even said she would never come near him again. Sena, of course, does not remember this. Rashad remembers that this was when they arrived at his compound. The girl says she really doesn't remember. The duke tells her to forget what he said and that he was wrong to worry about it. This makes him angry. Sena asks if he is angry, and she repeats that she does not remember it at all. Rashad says that it doesn't matter anymore and that he is sleeping, so he asks him not to talk to him anymore. Suddenly Sena thanks his highness for telling him the situation. She asks him why he hasn't gone to his room to sleep, as he must be uncomfortable here. Suddenly the duke sits down beside Sena and asks if he can sleep here. The girl says that of course he can, adding that it is warm and cozy. In the morning Sena wakes up and sees Dion standing before her, but he is no longer a little child, but a grown man. The girl is a little shocked. Sena asks why she is lying in her room if she fell asleep in the living room. The boy says that he became an adult this morning and brought her here because she was uncomfortable on the couch. Then he wanted to leave, but the girl wouldn't let go of his hair. The girl wants to get out of bed and apologizes, but Dion stops her by the hand and tells her that the Duke has also returned to his normal state and has gone to look for Aaron. He still holds the girl's hand and says they are here together. He suggests that they have breakfast together. At the cafe, Sena sits at the same table as Robin, and he tells her all sorts of stories. The girl can only listen. She didn't expect Dion to leave on important business without eating. The girl thought she could eat alone when, for some reason, she met Robin. Robin tells her how he passed out from drinking. The girl wonders if Rivalo decided to settle the situation by making everyone think they had passed out drunk. A man says he has been offered a job as a freelance hunter in his hometown. Since the guild has almost no business now, he is really thinking about returning home. He offers Sena to go with him. 
Saner remains indifferent and asks why she should go to his hometown. Robin says that the manager offered him the job and he knows him well, so there might be a job for her. He adds that his town is really nice and comfortable. Sana tells him that she is not going anywhere and says that he knows what her situation is now. Robin and Sana leave the cafe together. Suddenly, Dion approaches them and Sana asks him if he didn't say he was going to be busy today. He tells her it ended earlier than he expected. Robin asks who it is and if they know each other. The girl apologizes for forgetting to introduce them. She introduces them, calling them both good friends. Dion says it is nice to meet you and that he has heard of you. Robin is also pleased to meet him. Suddenly Sana tells Dion that his hair sticks out in all directions. Dion says she arranged them so nicely this morning. Robin wants Sana to explain. The girl says she wanted to buy cookies for him and Sasha. Again, she doesn't mention that the Duke is her friend under Robin. Robin is now wondering who else Sasha is. It seems he was wrong to hope that he and Sana had a close relationship. He can see that she is having a lot of fun with this guy, and he simply runs away from them. Robin wants her to be happy, even if not with him. Afterwards, Anna says there were rumors that Robin got drunk and cried his eyes out. Sana thinks it must be because he is leaving the guild, and she bets that the thought of ending his career has upset him. But that's not the case. Dale Fravel suddenly enters the guild. Isabella Fravel is with him. This is a very unexpected visit, as the man almost never comes here. Anna says that he rarely comes through the main entrance anymore because he hates the scrutiny of even working on the estate. The girls worry that this does not mean the guild is closing. A man who refused to attend his wife's funeral looks really terrible, and Sana thinks that Dion is nothing like him. Anna remembers that she called Sana to offer her a job that is safe and meets her requirements. She is paid a handsome sum of 50,000 rupees. The girl asks if the job is really so good, if Anna wants to give it to someone who really needs it, since she is doing well enough with the Duke's rent. Anne says they asked for her specifically. She tells them that the job will be given to Owen, a C-class hunter. Owen is one of five C-class hunters in the Adventurers Guild. As the youngest member to reach this rank, he has never failed a quest. He is a legend. He is a brilliant scholar, recognized by the Academy, whose discoveries include the ancient ruins of Ilioros, the tombs of the Karnan royal family, the grimoire of the sage Cyril, and much more. This man is loved by both hunters and the general public. He is the best in the world. Sejna asks why a man like him hires her. Anna tells him that he needs a hunter who speaks Paulician. She assumes that Owen found some inscriptions in the language in the ruins he found recently. Sena says she doesn't know Paulician very well. Anna reminds him that the girl has lived in Polysia before, and she is also an experienced hunter, so he must have thought she would make a good assistant. The girl thinks that Owen's choice of her over all the other hunters might be a heavenly opportunity. Anna doesn't think Sana is very interested in the offer, and she thinks she's turning it down. Sana says that if he has chosen her personally, she should at least pay him a visit before refusing. The girl is immediately taken to Owen's house. A butler meets her at the entrance and tells her that the master is waiting. Walking down the corridor, she passes a large number of statues. All look at the girl as if watching her. Suddenly she sees a picture of a beautiful girl, and at the bottom of her hem is a picture of a group of demons. Suddenly a boy in a skull mask approaches her. Sana is very frightened and asks when he came. The man says that she reacts well and that it is a pleasure to talk to her. He apologizes and introduces himself as Owen. Sana tells him her name and thanks him for inviting her. When she looks at the boy's face, she realizes that she has seen him before. He is one of the male protagonists she has seen on the covers of the novel. Now Sana wonders why the male lead wanted to meet her and not Ellen. Owen says he always wanted to meet her. Sana asks how he knows her. Owen says he enjoyed hearing about her exploits on the expedition to the rock. And he also expresses his respect for the incident with the Chiquita demon. He heard that the girl fought demons all night to protect her injured colleagues. Sana says she was just lucky. And apparently that's why she was promoted to C-class, even though she was demoted immediately afterwards. Owen also heard about her many nicknames, such as Heroine or Invincible. The girl says that she does not like them all very much. For her it is just a kind of kindergarten. She just happens to recover a little faster than others. Owen thinks this is quite a unique quality. He believes that the girl will become an excellent hunter and even reach the same class as him. The girl says that he overestimates her, and that in order to reach C-class, she needs to make a historical achievement, and she believes that she cannot do that. The boy asks if she has any interest in ancient ruins, as excavating them can be quite exciting. He has seen many hunters who enjoy the work. Sana says that only those who have financial stability can take on this kind of work. To do so, one must travel abroad and form one's own personal team 
which will definitely cost a lot of money. Owen says that Duke Rashad would like to help her. The girl says she will not accept the Duke's help. Owen asks if they have a good relationship. The girl says they have a normal relationship, but he is just an acquaintance and that's all. Owen's interest in the girl is not the only reason he called her. He is also interested in Duke Rashad. Sana knew something was wrong, which means he had another goal in mind from the beginning. Indeed, why would an S-class hunter want to see the D-class garbage at all? So everything that happened before was just flattery. Sana asks if he is looking for investment from the Duke. But Owen says that's not what he meant. There is another matter to discuss. The boy asks if she met any demons while she was with the Duke. The girl replies that she never did. She wonders how he knows this since the Duke said he kept all news of demons secret and not even the investigation department knew. Owen suddenly asks if he can tell the girl an old story. He begins to search his bookshelves. He finds the right book and opens it. He begins his story by saying that long ago there was a race of non-humans. They opened the gates of hell and came to this earth where they mocked at men and amused themselves. They could cause physical pain to men. They could seduce them. They liked to set people against each other, to kill them in the end. They brought hell into this world. They conserved energy, polluted the earth, and changed its flora and fauna. The very creatures that were created in this process are what they now call demons. Under the influence of their superhuman power, which created three different states of being, some lost their minds and became non-humans, others absorbed the power and became mages, and the last group learned to purify the energy of non-humans and became priests. The abilities of the non-human race were enough to awaken the dormant holy power within them, the humans. The boy says that sounds ironic. While the priests succeeded in destroying most of the race, the survivors could not find a way to kill their main enemies. The priests decided to imprison the souls of the 33 highest non-humans and keep them within the Holy Empire. These 33 souls have been kept safely within the Empire until now. However, three of them have recently disappeared. Owen is now searching for them at the request of the Empire. There were five families who helped the priests exercise the high inhumans. They are the only ones in the Empire who know of the existence of the seal. They are also the only ones who have access to it, and the house of Duke Rashad is one of these five. Suddenly the boy noticed that the girl had fallen asleep. Owen wakes her and says that perhaps his story was too boring. Sana apologizes, but says that she has never been interested in legends. Owen also apologizes, but Sana says it's okay and suggests they move on to the next story. The line of the non-humans attracts demons. Demons are born from the power of non-humans, so they tend to follow them like children follow their parents. And indeed, the non-humans can summon demons even in their sealed state, which is why the Holy Empire takes careful measures to protect the stones with which the non-humans are sealed. And if Duke Rashad has one of these stones, then demons are sure to appear around him. Owen reports that the non-humans are not the only ones he is looking for. He is also looking for a priestess and asks if Duke Rashad is after any particular woman. Owen fails to notice that this subject is more interesting to Sana than legends. Owen tells us that the first priestess sacrificed herself to seal the three highest non-humans. This seal is still in place today. But there is a caveat. The priestess exists in every generation, and her blood is the only way to break the seal. As he just mentioned, Duke Rashad is looking for a certain girl, in case he wants to break the seal. He will have to be killed for the common good. Sana stands up suddenly and says that she knows nothing about it. Owen says it would be best to ask him directly. He adds that she can bring it up anytime she wants, as it is a request, not a demand. The girl says that she has other things to do, so she will leave now. Outside, she thinks that the Duke was never in love with Helen. Owen's servant gives her a pile of boxes and tells her that they are gifts from his master. If Sana refuses them, the servant will be in trouble. Sana thought that Duke Rashad would play the male lead, but given what she heard earlier, he may actually be the thief. Dion opens the door of their house. She comes in with many boxes and sacks. Dion asks if she has been shopping. The girl says these are gifts. When she opens them, she sees that they contain a huge amount of mana stones and realizes that they are worth a lot of money. Sana asks if it is true that not all the boxes contain mana stones. She simply cannot believe it. Dion asks if he may open the other boxes. The girl asks him to do it if it's not too much trouble. Sana thinks that this is just obscenely expensive. She cannot accept these gifts and they should be returned. Although the disappearance of a few stones would not be noticed. Dion tells us that the other boxes contain mana harvesting equipment, and it also looks quite expensive. Sana says that this is wrong and that she must return everything. 
She adds that she can't just leave it on the street and asks Dion to help her move the boxes. She asks him to leave them in the empty room on the second floor. The boy puts two full boxes and a sack on his shoulders. Sena asks if it is too much for him, but Dion says it is not. The girl mentions that Owen's employee had a hard time carrying the things. The boy says he will take it up first, but asks the girl who gave it to her. Sena wonders what to tell him, for if she begins to tell the whole story, it will take too long. She says they are all gifts from a friend. Dion says she seems to have many friends. At night Sena could not sleep. All the time in bed she tried to remember something from her past. But unfortunately the time was wasted. Rashad had already prepared a large breakfast. After a sleepless night, Sena is still not very happy. Rashad asks her if she is not happy. She wonders if the Duke might have stolen the ceiling stone. When she thinks about it, he has the face of a secret thief. Rashad asks if she would like him to prepare something else for her. The girl is distracted and says that she doesn't need it and that everything is really fine. Sena asks his highness if anything happened yesterday. The duke says he was just busy and apologizes for having to leave. The girl asks him not to apologize as it was a normal day anyway. The duke looks at Dion and asks what is wrong with him. Sena thinks that Dion is behaving like this because of the gifts her friend gave her. The boy says he won't eat anymore, gets up from the table, and sits down on the couch. Rashad asks Said how much they quarreled. She says they did not quarrel at all. She says she doesn't even understand why Dion is so angry. The duke asks her if she wants him to ask the boy. Rashad wanted to tell them the latest news about the demons, but he can't in this atmosphere. He has asked Aaron to bring something, so he asks to be allowed to explain everything as soon as the assistant arrives. Sena says that in that case she will go and buy a cake before Aaron arrives. Dion loves sweets. When Sena sees Rashad smiling, she thinks she was wrong to think he was a secret thief, for how can you say that about a man with a smile like that? As the girl leaves the cake shop, Owen suddenly runs up to her. He tells her that they have a big problem and asks if she has the mana harvesting tools he sent her. Owen says they need to check them out right away. He thinks a strange element has been added to the mix, and her house may explode. They are in a great hurry to get to Sejna's house, especially the girl, for whom her house is too valuable. The girl calms down a little when she sees her house intact and asks what object he was talking about and says she will take it with her. Owen says that if she doesn't handle it properly it will explode and he will have to go and get it himself. Sena asks why he sent her such a thing in the first place and Owen is very apologetic. She tells him where his gifts are and asks him not to stay long. Suddenly Sena remembers that Duke Rashad should be home by now. If he plans to break the seal, she must not let them meet. Sena tells him that her house is a mess and asks him to wait until she has tidied up a bit. But Owen has already opened the door and says it looks pretty clean to him. The girl sees that the Duke and Dion are not at home and is relieved. Entering the house, Owen suddenly stops abruptly and tells her not to panic and to listen to him. He pulls out a gun and says he is sure there is a burglar in their house. He draws her attention to the footprints, which are much larger than her footprints, and the direction indicates that someone entered the house from the outside. Owen says that an explosion is not their priority right now, and asks the girl if he can look through her house. Sena asks him to wait and says there is no burglar in her house. Suddenly there is a creaking sound as if someone is walking around the house. Owen follows the sound, opens the door to one of the rooms, and points his gun. The Duke confronts him and asks who the hell he is. Dion picks up Owen's gun and says it's pretty cool. The kid points the gun at Owen's head and asks if they should test it to see if it's as effective as it looks. Suddenly they are stopped by Sena. She points to the door and says that if they are going to kill him, they should do it outside. The three tie up Owen. The boy tells his highness that they have not seen each other for a long time. The Duke asks if they have met before. Owen says that they have met three times, but Rashad does not really remember. Sena thinks he is definitely the Duke. Owen gives him a murderous look and he doesn't bat an eyelid. The bound man tells Dion he hasn't seen him before and asks who he is. Dion puts the gun to his head again. Owen begs Sena to let the guy go. He says that this guy is just psychologically draining him. Dion tells him to stop talking like he's an object. Sena asks Owen to tell her honestly if he came here to kill Duke Rashad. The boy asks the girl how she can say such a thing. Sena says that he was the one who first lied to her about the whole explosive story of his damned gifts. Dion says that means he's the one who sent the gifts. He asks if it wasn't because of some personal feelings for Sena or something like that. Owen says it certainly wasn't, and that he had come to retrieve the ceiling stone stolen by the last duke. Sena says she thought he would say that. Owen says he also came here to find the priestess. He tells Sena to stop hiding the truth. He knows that the priestess is none other than Sejna. 
The three laugh at these words. Owen asks if it is true. He has heard that the girl is known for her amazing healing powers. Sena says it has nothing to do with her at all, and the fact that she recovers faster than others only shows her good immunity, and the gossip about her immortality is just an exaggeration. Everyone enjoys giving such silly nicknames to inferior hunters. She also hates temples. If she were a priestess, she would be attracted to holy power. But the sight of men in robes disgusts her. She does not know any priests, not even intimately. They are all too strict and stubborn in her opinion. In fact, she is on bad terms with them. She has never healed anyone with holy power, so she asks Owen if he thinks she is too far gone to be a priestess. The boy asks the duke if the last duke of his family really stole the sealing stone. Rashad can swear on his family's name that it never happened. He actually wonders where Owen heard all this nonsense and begins to seriously question his identity. Owen asks to check his inside jacket pocket. In the pocket was the Holy Emperor's ring. To check if it is real, Dion throws the ring into the corner of the room, and if it is real, it will appear on his master's finger. The wearer of the Holy Emperor's ring can only be replaced with the permission of his highness. Therefore, it can never be taken from its owner. The ring is indeed returned to Owen. The boy asks if he didn't say he received a request from the Holy Empire. Sena vaguely remembers him saying something like that, but she's not sure because she was asleep at the time. Owen says it doesn't matter. Since he has already shown his, he asks the Duke to show his as well. The Carlman family should receive such a gift. Rashad says he does not have it, and it disappeared some 30 years ago. Owen asks Sena if she doesn't really believe him. Sena looks forward to getting to the bottom of this. There are indeed several rings of the Holy Emperor in the world. There are five others, all of which are exact copies of the original. But even though they are copies, they also return to their owner when they are far from him. The very first priestess gave these five rings to five different families. It was a symbol of the promise to watch over the sealed non-humans and keep their existence secret. Owen says that 30 years ago a man with the ring of the House of Carmen escaped with the sealing stone of the inhuman lineage. Recently there has been a strange outbreak of mutated demons. Because of this, all the mages in the association's investigation department have gone on an extended business trip. What if the duke is deliberately preventing contact with the investigation department? In order to cover up the case, Sena believes that she was wrong and that they only went to investigate the situation. While all this was going on, Rashad left his duchy and came to the capital. The first thing he did when he arrived was to look for the girl. Owen says that the head of the house that stole the seal is looking for the girl, and asks if this is not suspicious. Sena thinks that Owen's statement doesn't make sense, but that doesn't mean it's completely without merit. Does the duke have other aims? Suddenly Aaron enters and apologizes for being late. He says he had to spend a lot of time making sure he was okay, but he was able to get him there safely. He notices a very strange scene, a man tied up, Dion with a gun, Sena and Rashad around him. He turns away and leaves, apologizing for disturbing him and saying that he didn't see anything, and Sena asks him to wait. The girl says it is not what he thought. Aaron asks if this really has nothing to do with torture or murder. Sena says of course not, and she would never allow it in her house. Aaron takes out a very strange notebook, but the girl is afraid to open it. Dion says he has an idea and asks her to give him the notebook. The boy approaches Owen and partially unties him. He tells the boy to open it. The duke says they've opened it before, but Owen is still afraid. He opens the notebook anyway, and they read entry number 25, It is cloudy today. I think the Marquis of Euclid has done another experiment on me while I was asleep. I am a little dizzy, but not as bad as last time. According to the Marquis, he injected even more of the blood this time. But I still can't remember anything. Why am I locked in here? What is my name? Entry number 82, now I can hold some dark smoke with my fingertips. They say this is a success because it means I can produce mana. The Marquis collected this dark smoke in a glass jar. After that, everything was a blur. I think I fainted after the Marquis took the smoke from me. Record number 166, the Marquis brought a blonde girl into my cell. At that moment I realized something instinctively. When I asked her her name, the girl said it was Ellen. I realized that this child had given me her blood. Rashad says that he met the author of this diary two years ago while traveling in the north, and that it was pure chance. Sena says that if what is written in it is true, then the Marquis is trying to use Ellen's blood to revive the race of Inhumans. The Duke says that it is most likely true, but they cannot say that he has succeeded. The man's magic was rather weak and unstable. Besides, judging by the fact that he couldn't travel very far from the Marquis estate, he still needs Ellen's blood. Owen asks where the unstable man is now. Rashad says he has lost him. However, he eventually finds the man's location. 
he must have been in a hurry, for he forgot the diary. The duke showed it to the emperor, and his highness advised them to give Helen safety first. For this reason he asked her to go with him to the Carlman estate when he found her. But she refused at that time. Sena did not know that his aim at that time was only to protect Helen. The girl asks why the demons keep appearing here. Rashad says that it is most likely that the monster sends them. If he can attack Helene and get at least a drop of her blood, it will help him regain his strength. Sena asks what's with the barrier and isn't it supposed to keep the demons out? Rashad says that they have been having trouble with it lately. All the Imperial magicians have been sent to investigate the problem, but they have not yet found the cause. He asks that it be kept a secret, as it would be problematic if the public knew about it. Sena now realizes what has been going on all this time. Rashad was not a stalker at all and wanted to protect Ellen. Sena is desperate, thinking that she has ruined everything, and if she had just figured things out, she would have at least never let the demons into her house. She thinks she just dug her own grave. Dion sees that she is very depressed and asks her if she is okay. The Duke also thinks that it is his fault and that he should have persuaded Helen. Sena says that she will defend her house and must not be discredited. The same goes for Ellen's safety. Rashad asks Owen if he has heard anything. He says he has his ears to the ground, of course, but he doesn't trust the Duke. Sena thinks that this situation with Helen has upset Dion as well, and she suggests that they talk in a separate room. The girl asks if he is worried. He says that of course he is. Sena says she thought so. The girl says the thing is, she already knew how he felt. Not much time has passed since then, but it was understandable given his frequent visits. Dion says that he could not have imagined that it would be so obvious, and he is a little embarrassed. Sena says that he shouldn't be so embarrassed, and she knows how long he has liked this girl, so it would be strange if he had already given up on her. Dion thinks she means someone else and asks who she is talking about. Sena says she means Helene, of course. She adds that dangerous situations will arise as long as Helen is a priestess. This means that they may have to deal with demons much stronger than those that have appeared so far. So she says that maybe Dion should stop coming to her house. By this proposal she wants to create security for Dion. Dion asks if she thinks he will be in danger. After all, the boy said that the demon they faced last time was the first one he had ever fought and demons are most abundant in this particular neighborhood. Dion reminds them that he can use magic. Sena says she remembers when he almost lost control because of it. Dion says that he can help as well, and asks the girl not to tell her not to come here anymore. After much persuasion, Sena agrees, but on one condition. The Duke enters Sena and Dion's room. The boy is writing something at the table. Sena is carrying a pile of books. She says that since they now know that the demons will be here again, they must prepare for it and they have to learn as much as they can about demons. If they learn the names and weaknesses of each one, they will become stronger. Sena says that she has looked at the matter from many different angles, and has come to the conclusion that the best course of action begins with them telling Ellen the whole story. Suddenly, Ellen herself knocks on Sena's door. The Duke says that Sejna's plan seems impossible, but that it can still be tried. Rashad and Dion go to another room. Sena opens the door to Helene. She says that she bought some biscuits and has some left, so she decided to share them with Sena, and she also has some for her. Sena invites the girl to her house and offers her hot tea. Ellen also brought Sena some medicine for her arm wound. Sena is very happy and thinks that Ellen is very good. Sena comes closer and asks Ellen where she lived before she opened the flower shop. Ellen replies that she is not sure, for all her memories of the past are rather vague. People from the temple find her unconscious in the woods. They put her to work at the temple, and she used all her earnings to open a flower shop. And her name is the only thing she remembers from that past. Sena asks what happened to her parents. Alina replies that she has no desire to find them. The girl feels that her life in the past was not the happiest. She shows a scar on her forehead and says that one of the priests said it was a very old scar, and that she had many others all over her body. So she does not want to know her past, and she will never try to find out about it again. Sena thinks that she should still warn the girl that she is in danger. She asks if Ellen knows the Marquis of Euclid. But the girl does not hear what Sena asks her, and repeats the question louder and louder. But Ellen still can't hear her. After meeting Helene, Sena tells Dion and Rasha that she now truly understands that Helene erased her memories. She says that she can no longer even hear the Marquis's name. Someone listens to their conversation outside the window. It is none other than Owen. A few hours earlier, Owen thought the Duke looked suspicious. And the first thing he has to do is to convince Sane that Carlman is not so white and fluffy. Near Sane's house he saw Ellen, who had come to bring the girl some biscuits. And then he heard the whole conversation. Now Rashad asked Sane what she intended to do now, and Owen was still listening. 
She had already said that she would defend her home and see to Ellen's safety. But that doesn't mean she'll fight the Marquis and his kind of inhumans. She has enough demons to deal with. When the conversation is over, Owen thinks he shouldn't be suspicious of the Duke no matter what. But it's too risky to meet him face to face. In the morning, Owen comes to Sana's house and says that he has come for his punishment. He has caused her much trouble, so he thinks he deserves to be punished. He tells Sana that she can beat him as much as she wants. Sana asks him if he is a pervert and who in their right mind would ask for such a thing. She tells him to leave if he has nothing else to say. Owen says he can't leave and that he feels guilty about his mistakes, so he's come to make them right. The boy says that he came out of nowhere with a gun, accused the duke without solid evidence, secretly sent her a gift, and lied. He bows and apologizes for all this. Sana simply closes the door and wishes him well. If you don't want to miss my new videos, support the channel by subscribing and don't forget to like the video.